it make a start and just welcome everybody and uh, hope you're all keeping well and uh, enjoying the sunshine while it lasts before Easter comes and the snow with it. <laughs> if we can, uh, I'm not aware of anybody given apologies, so I think we should all be here. So on that note, if we can take the declaration of interest, any board member who's aware of a private or personal conflict of interest relating to any item on the agenda will be required to disclose at this stage or when the conflict arises during consideration of the item. Uh, I'm not aware either that we've got any public members joining us. Do you know, Warren? No, Paul. Um, we are recording the meeting as we have done previously to put it on the website. Okay. And is this meeting being recorded or just minuted? It's being recorded. Okay, thanks, Warren. If we can then move on to the minutes of the last meeting, which was on for the open board meeting on the 27th of January. And what I will do, as always, is take any inaccuracies or any matters arising as we go through each of the pages, starting with page four. Hello. Sorry, it's just a sound here, so I'm sorry. Yeah. Are we okay? On page okay. four, I just know that uh, Stephen is spelt incorrectly. It should be with a PH. I'm right, Steve, in that, aren't I? You are? Yeah. So that's on page four. Page five. Just in the action log uh, item, action two, it should be provided. Yeah. Right, OK, thanks, Michael. Page six. Page seven. Page eight. Nine. I think Paul has frozen. Can you hear us, Paul? Paul, we've only just got you back. You froze for a while. That's right, I did, yes. We were on page 30. We got you to yeah. page 9, yeah. Okay. Something has gone wrong somewhere. Are you still there, Paul? I am just about something of a technical pitch. I should be. There we are. Page 40. On page 14, it's bullet point five, uh, where it starts was the way in which trust was managing contact. Should there be between patients in there? Yes, it should. Yeah. Yeah. Page 14. Page 15, uh, just on bullet point six and bullet point seven, there's reference there again to uh, uh, face masks. That will come up again later on in the agenda under the COVID. I presume either Noel or yourself, Sue, will update us on that. Yes, we can. OK, that's page 15. Page 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Just on page 21, it's under the questions were invited from the board. It's the second bullet point. It makes reference to care group. That should just be care groups. Uh, that's 21. 22. Um, at the top of page 22, the trust was to return the further assurance uh, template by the 15th of February. It's just to note that that was done, because obviously this was going back to the open board meeting in January. So just to record that was done. It was, yeah. Page 23. 
page 24. Uh, just the last bullet point on page 24. I know we'll make reference to uh, workforce uh, on a number of occasions throughout the meetings today. But just on that bullet point where it was referring to 242 vacancies, and I know that Noel will update us later on. But I was just reflecting from over the last couple of years. At one point, we had vacancies of about 270, 290, and we did exceptional work, or Noel and his colleagues did, in reducing that number down to just over 100 at one point, and it's now back up to 242 again. And there's lots of reasons as to why that has happened. But I just wondered, you know, is that due to our increase in services or is it just the increased competition across the NHS? NHS. Mm -hmm. I'd say neither of the above. We've had a pandemic and in my view, we've lost an entire generation of nurses who have been who found it extraordinarily difficult to be redeployed into service. Sickness levels are running at animal time high and uncertain led to an increase in resignations and turnover combined with a significant reduction in recruitment capacity. So um, uh, this will be a feature of the health service. We went into the pandemic with 47,000 RN vacancies um, in England in the provider sector. And my suspicion is that that will dramatically increase. Uh, we are no different to any other trust. We have been uniquely successful uh, in recruiting 94 Indian and Filipino nurses from abroad in the last financial year. Uh, and that's an extraordinary success given the constraints around international travel, quarantine, um, and having to undertake induction um, remotely, as well as hospital centres being closed at various points in the year. Uh, but your broader point around local recruitment and gradual recruitment is areas where we need to redouble our efforts as well as, in my view, rely upon overseas recruitment for the foreseeable future. So uh, the current position is worse than you described, um, as we'll see from the board paper that more than well uh, refer to later. Uh, and we have a significant challenge to overcome but I'm confident that Catherine has plans to provide a more sensitive and responsive approach to local recruitment, but that doesn't uh, in any way diminish the efforts we must make to retain the excellent people that we have currently on staff. Uh, so uh, the workforce is, is a huge issue, but it doesn't refer to any of the points that you make. This is purely a function of uh, the pandemic in my view. I'm going to come back on one of those points, if I may, Chair, but first of all, could I ask Morgan to come in? She's put her hand up. It, it is just worth also recognising that we have changed the basis upon which we report our vacancies. So historically, we, as you recall, had a vacancy factor, we also accounted for others that were unavailable for work, and uh, as of the end of last year, we have started to fit that back into a, a pure vacancy against establishment so that should see an increase in those numbers so i think that should be noted in the council yeah. because that is quite important and we are also accounting for there is some establishment alterations on the back of business cases etc that have been recognized and they've been annotated in, in the board papers as well so, just, so we are clear there is, there is some adjustment for the way they are being reported as well so it's not apples with apples, Paul, I think is what Morven's saying, yeah. partly because yeah. we've changed the counting so that it's more meaningful in, in order for us to use it as a way to um, optimise recruitment. But also in October, the board approved about £21 million worth of development. So those posts have come in and obviously there's a lag between us approving them and getting people in. So both of those um, matters have increased the um apparent vac or the actual vacancies on top of the point that um, Noel makes. Okay, thank you for that. That's uh, helpful for that uh, obviously update on that. Page 25, 26. Just on page 26, Chair, the second off bullet, yeah. second off bottom bullet point um, references the position accounted for 520k in COVID funding. That should be additional COVID funding over and above the core 13.66 million allocation. 
OK, thank you, David. Page 27. And then we move on to the action log. And the first one on the action log is uh, uh, item number three, Warren, which sorry, you have sorry, Chairman. Obviously... Chairman, um, sorry, Noel like... wants to make a point. Go what page are you oh, on? Sorry. Uh, in the minutes, it doesn't appear that Catherine Burner's reference is being present, although she does appear to make a contribution to meetings. It's quite a good trick. Oh, so she's not listed. She is listed. She is listed. Attendance. She's in attendance. OK, so on to the action log item number three, that's the board development program, Warren, which you've obviously included the schedule. Yeah, so at this stage, uh, Paul, it's, it's provisional in terms of um, certainly the, the safeguarding of mental capacity act slides have already been worked on by Noel's team. So um, I think we, we will be fine for what we're proposing for April. Uh, I need to do more work with the individual teams just to firm up the deadlines for the other elements. And clearly we have some flexibility um, in terms of other slots during the year so we can move things around or add anything else that the board would like and um, considers an item of importance. OK, Great. Paul, thanks, Warren. Paul, could Hello? I add later on on the um, in the papers will also it's a CQC paper under my items will also um, we've pulled together a um, schedule of the development that we have done in year because whilst we didn't follow a formal pre agreed program, we've done an awful lot of development that we've needed to do on the back of COVID. So I'll refer to that under one of my items for the year 2021. That's great. Thank you, Sue. Item number six, which is the, the plans in relation to sustainability object, objective on the BAF. Sue? Yes, that's in the papers. That's in the paper. Uh, next item, number seven, which relates to you, Paul, is about being on the sustainability working group. I presume you've already joined that. Uh, that, well, <clears throat> to my knowledge, that there hasn't been a meeting. I haven't got anything in the diary, so um, I presume it's just not happening for the moment. Yeah, so, so Paul's formally now a member on the back of what the board agreed, so Paul will be joining us at our next meeting. Okay, okay thank you for that. Next item, Morven, is relation to infographics and uh, charts. They're incorporated in the uh, integrated performance report. So they're in the report, Paul, if you couldn't hear more than right. we're just using one mic in this first bit. So I'm they're in the report it. later. OK, then we'll move on to item number 10, which is in relation to it's for you, Jeremy, relation to the facilities. I think this is down as mine, so um, we've left oh, all the... <laughs> We've left all the current rest facilities in place and we're looking and we come on later today to discuss um, capital. We're looking at what we need to do as we move forward into um, the next financial year. So that is work in progress. But just to assure you, all the rest facilities we put in place still exist at this point. OK, thanks, Sue. And the next one is you, Sue, in relation to procurement. It is, and I've included in my paper um, an explanation of which, what this means, um, which I'll draw your attention to when we get on to my um, update. OK, thank you. Next one, Paul, is relation to blood and uh, obviously transfusion. And you did send us yesterday a briefing paper on, on an update. Do you want to comment on that just now? I just, um, yeah, just very quickly, just to, <clears throat> for everyone else's benefit. Um, <clears throat> The um, annual uh, Transplant Congress took place on the 24th and 25th of February, obviously virtually this year, 24th being the board day. So I had a sketchy attendance on the first day, but sat in for, for the full, um, the second day. Um, there were about 250 delegates, most of which were medics, and most of the agenda was, was, was me medical, had a you know, very strong medical bias. Um, well, the interesting bit for me was uh, some of the statistics that were shared, and there were literally pages and pages of it. So I won't bore you with, with all of those, but for those, probably the NEDs that aren't as close to it. Um, uh, national donation activity, hardly surprisingly, uh, was significantly larger in 2020 compared to previous years and compared to budget. Um, 
Well, perhaps not as far down as one might expect. Um, it was about between 30 and 40 percent down. And there is a, a chart which shows, which I've put in the briefing paper, which shows the decline. Hardly surprisingly, it fell off a cliff in April uh, and had a slow recovery uh, during the course of the year to end up about um, probably 15 or 18 percent down at the year end, but throughout the period it was 30 to 40. Um, CDDFT also showed a decrease, but we were down about 25 percent, so marginally better than the national average. Um, not surprisingly, we've had no missed referrals, 100 percent SNOD presence, which are the two key KPIs, um, but we've had uh, about the same level of family declines. Um, which again, I think is actually reasonable, is pretty, pretty good given the, the circumstances under which during 2020 families were asked to, um, uh, to, to donate organs. So pretty steady performance, I think, from our point of view. Um, the inevitable consequences, though, is that so the decrease in transplants uh, resulted in growth in waiting lists. And of course, uh, amongst those waiting lists were fatalities where people didn't receive organs uh, in time. All the local services were stood down. Uh, St John's Award and the Regional Remembrance Services were all stood down. I was a bit disappointed because we were due to host the, the remember, Remembrance Service this year. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether or not we'll do it in 2021. Excuse me. Or um, uh, it'll be carried forward to 2022. We'll, we'll find it over the um, in the next few weeks. The um, Taking you back, it's about 18 months since I've last briefed you on this, but uh, you may remember that at that time um, uh, legislation was in process and a campaign was in process to uh, change the law um, effectively to deemed consent. And it was Max and Chiera's law. You may remember the video that we that I, that I kind of showed you. Um, that uh, uh, campaign was pulled, went, went live on the 1st of March in 2020 and was pulled very quickly um, because all of the advertising material were based around the strap line of pass it on, um, which of course could hardly have been a worse strap line during the course of a, a, a pandemic. Um, so the legislation was allowed to pass through rather than lose the place in the, uh, um, in the legislative agenda. It went through and became law on the 20th of May, but none of the promotional material that was to support it, the television campaigns, or very little of it, uh, was seen because it was pulled very early because of the pandemic. Um, but the law did come into force and it, it's hardly surprising, it's very difficult to read any trends as to whether it's had the impact or not. I don't think you can really read too much at all of what happened mm. during 2020 because there were so many other bigger factors uh, affecting the, um, the outcomes. The, the, the new campaign, uh, Leave Them Certain, went live on the 21st, on the 20th of February uh, this year. It, it's been on television a few times, you might have seen it. Um, uh, it's on YouTube, I've got a link for the thing there, it's called Leave Them Certain. Um, and it's quite a thought-provoking 20-second, 30-second um, promotional film. Um, coming back to local measures, the plans for the memorial uh, at Durham are underway and um, I'm quite close to getting that proposal completed. We've got a target date to complete the proposal and get you guys to sign it off by the end of May. So probably not next board meeting, but board meeting afterwards. I hope to be able to show you something there. Um, two points of a more general interest, actually th three points of a more general interest. Um, um, during the course of 2020, uh, Harrogate and, um, I can't remember the name of the hospital, but, uh, but uh, the, um, the transplant unit in Cardiff introduced a process called um, Moment of Honour. Um, which is, uh, again, there's a video on the, on the, for the link to you, uh, and it was shown during the Congress. Um, and basically it's a, it's a moment to reflect um, on, the de on the deceased um, and make reference to the fact that, um, uh, you know, of, of the donation and the gift that they're making. Um, quite a powerful film. If you've got three or four minutes to spend, uh, to spare, it's quite a, quite a useful thing. Um, Lisa saw the film and introduced it. Uh, well, Lisa saw the film before the Congress, so um, so that's something that CDD FT, uh, you know, we're doing that now. We're introduced that, and uh, and Avanash and, and Ian are driving that uh, as part of the process. So so that's a you know a really positive, um, a really positive thing, and gives um, 
uh, gives a lot of comfort to, to, the, to the families in certain situations. And then just one specific, uh, we had a recent donor that I wanted to share with you uh, at Darlington, um, uh, a 22 year old young lady um, died very traumatically and, uh, you know, and very quickly. Um, uh, her partner was, uh, she, she lives in the area from, from the south originally, lives in the area with her partner. Her parents were summoned, they drove the 300 miles to be told that, um, that she was beyond recovery. Um, what was um, remarkable about it was that um, the staff in the ITU, the doctors and nurses, arranged amongst themselves to form a guard of honour. So when the young lady was taken down to theatre, um, uh, and with her, and her parents and a partner with her, um, that all lined the corridors as a guard of honour uh, and a mark of respect, uh, which was which was fab. The, the really Fantastic thing, I think, is that um, it wasn't organised by management and there were no cameras. So there was no PR benefit, there was no uh, uh, publicity with the thing. It was just a genuine, heartfelt mark of respect, which I think speaks volumes for the culture uh, on that unit. And, and, uh, and Richard Hickson in particular, who was, uh, was instrumental in organising it. And then just finally, to uh, give you a heads up that uh, you know, we've got... Um, two active clods in there now, Avanash and Ian, who are both doing a good job, and Lisa, as always, is, is holding it all together. So things are, you know, doing going pretty well uh, within within the trust. Uh, and that was it. That's great. Thank you, Paul. Does anybody have any question for Paul? Yeah, yes, no. could I yeah. just yeah. ask if you're doing the memorial, Paul, if you want to put a request into charitable funds. The next meeting's, I think, the 3rd of May. And we quite liked, because I know it's going to be over 10,000, isn't it? We yes, quite right. like to get them in for that one, please, because um, we keep getting uh, bids in, in between meetings and it gets quite difficult with emails flying around. So if you could try and get something in for that meeting, that would be great. How do I do that, Jenny? Do I just email you? Would that be sufficient? Normally we get a business case. There is a form to fill in. If I ask that in to send you a form, somebody from the department should fill it in, I think, shouldn't they? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, we do that. Yeah, if you could, no, it's just the costings. It doesn't have to be great at the minute, but we could approve it in principle. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jenny. If we can then move on to item number 14, which is the board subcommittee structure. There's a paper later on. Uh, Sue and Warren on that. Shall we pick that up then? Yes. Yeah. Likewise, the next item, item number 15, is the nursing structure. There's a, a paper in the a board a paper on the papers later on, so we can pick that up later on as well. Then the next item, item number 16, summary of ophthalmology, never event, and we've got that in the board papers later on as well for comment. Uh, next item, Item, item number 17, uh, update report on mortality, and we've got that in the board papers. Um, item number 18, nursing and midwifery, nursing and midwifery emergency uh, standards. That was Catherine. Uh, uh, is there an update on that, or is that for later? Um, we've added a commentary to the IQ, IQPR. Third year student nurses have had 30 hours of paid placements and seven and a half hours of protected learning time, with the funding being provided through Health Education England. And this right. is an accumulation of the program requirements of 2,300 hours in practice in order to register uh, in September. Student feedback has been really supportive uh, and they feel that their confidence has increased. Um, as we support local recruitment, which I mentioned earlier, uh, between more managers and the students in these placements, that's also being reinforced. So one of the innovations that we're trying to see here is possibly a, a less formal but earlier approach to graduate recruitment. We're approaching all of the students where they stand this month and next, as opposed to a formal event, which is uh, uh, somewhat difficult in these constrained circumstances in June, which means that we will get access to our own students uh, six months earlier. That will reduce their anxiety and hopefully stop them being coached by Newcastle, which is the usual form. So uh, um, I, I'm very content that we've addressed that issue uh, and you'll see the detail in the form. That's great. No, thank you for that. 
And the next item, item number 19, which was to do with the trust performance and the number of care hours per patient. That's quite complicated to work through. So uh, the E-Roster Bureau um, and the special projects team, which will now be retitled the Digital Nurse Specialists team, um, are trying to work out how we can uh, uh, quantify that and present it in an accessible way. So I'm asking for that to be deferred until May, please. OK, that's great. Thanks, Noel. And item number 20 in relation to maternity uh, department staffing, that's in the papers for later on. OK, anything I've missed from the actions or from the minutes of the last meeting? No. no? And that does, we'll move on, Sue, to your item, item number four, update. OK, thank you, um, Chairman. I think if I may just very briefly um, cover two points that aren't in the papers. One is the Northern Echo Awards. So last week um, they were held and we were um, really pleased to get Employer of the Year. Um, Tissue Viability won a team award, as did one of our midwives. So just to acknowledge those great achievements um, from the staff within the trust. My second point is just to really um, outline some of the great collaborative integrated work that we're doing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we held an event with our GP. So this was a virtual event and this is a forerunner to more dialogue between GPs and ourselves, which would fall under, I guess, the banner of provider collaborative type endeavours. And we had a number of our clinicians and a number of GPs at that event, which was to look at cancer pathways and how we optimise them. That being particularly important because, as we know, some of the cancer referrals have not come through in the quantities that we would expect during the course of the pandemic. So we had um, four of our clinicians and um, our cancer manager present some of the changes um, to pathways that have been made, some of the ways for GPs to access those pathways. And there were over 200 GPs that attended that event. So that's the first event in a sequence of events that we've got to um, promote the collaborative work between primary care and secondary care and ensure that we have, if you like, single pathways for patients. So I think um, a big hats off to the team that prepared and presented that um, it went down really really well with the gp so we'll bring you more of that sort of work that we're doing as the uh, months roll on moving if i may then to the paper um, the first part of the paper looking at national um, matters is has largely been um, shared with the board previously in other fora but it's there for information. So that identifies the consultation um, that happened around the, um, as a forerunner to the white paper. Um, you can see that interestingly, in terms of the consultation, I'm on page 33, um, the consultation asked the four key questions that are outlined there, whether we agreed that the ICS is, um, or giving the, the ICS is a statutory footing in 2022, along with other legislative proposals, would be the right foundation for the NHS for the next decade. We did um, submit that we thought that that was the case, but you'll see, interestingly, it's about a half-half split when all stakeholder reviews were pulled together nationally. Um, we were then asked about, um, did we agree option two, which was a statutory corporate, corporate NHS body, offered the best model for promoting collaboration, which we said we did. Again, nationally, a bit of a split um, around that. Do we agree that other than mandatory participation of NHS and local authorities, membership should be left to local ICSs? We said we thought that that was um, appropriate. Um, nationally, slightly more agreed. There was slightly um, less that disagreed in that. And then finally, um, subject to the appropriate safeguards that services that currently are commissioned by NHSE should be transferred or delegated to the ICS, we agreed and it was a bit of a split nationally. For information and as the board knows, um, 
we didn't simply agree to these. We actually put some um, narrative in our response, largely um, pointing the national teams to look at some of the governance that would make these arrangements work optimally. And we had some thoughts for those. What then emerged was um, the white paper. There's been some time since our last public um, board and that white paper um, was really divided into three main chapters. It looked at the role of legislation, some of the proposals for that legislation and um, delivering for patients, citizens and local populations um, supporting implementation and innovation essentially um, alongside the legislation. So on page 35, I summarise um, each of those chapters and um, the second bullet point um, under key points actually looks at the proposals for legislation. So we've had time to um, work through this as an organisation. We are in the various um, ICS and ICP groupings that exist within the North East are looking at what this might mean. Clearly legislation's not been drafted yet, but we are expecting that first readings of that legislation will happen in May, according to the current timetable, which would allow with a smooth passage that legislation to come into place by the end of um, this financial, this next financial year ready for April 2022. I won't go through all of the detail, but obviously if anybody wants to pick anything up, happy to take that. I'll just draw attention to on page 37 at the very bottom in the slightly smaller type. There was a, a question that was raised at the board last time that we met about section 75 of the 2020-12 Health and Social Care Act and um, some of the changes that are signalled in that proposed legislative um, programme. They would include things like um, the services that we're familiar with that have gone out to tender such as smoking cessation not needing to be tendered in the future if the legislation goes forward as planned so essentially it um, repeals some of the original act and allows for where it's in the best interests um, and services can be provided by the health service the legislation that is proposed intends to take away a requirement for, um, for for that tendering process, essentially. That's great. Just, just, just on that, on, that Sue, on page 36, uh, the fifth bullet point, uh, it gets to do with procurement, where it says, obviously, uh, the, the services can go to the most appropriate supplier and i just wondered obviously we've gone through a very rigorous procurement process of services competitive tendering and so forth and with that bullet point it appears and maybe this is to be determined later on that that's now becoming rather relaxed and i just wonder what measures will be obviously we don't have the answer yet because we're waiting for further guidance but i just wonder what measures will appear in due course to make sure that we are going through a rigorous process and that the right supplier or provider will be determined so that's the the item of legislation i've just drawn your attention to on page is, yeah. seven so that little yeah. star mm. so essentially it would require those that are commissioning the services that wouldn't be ourselves not mm. to need to go outside of the NHS for services that hitherto they've needed mm. to do and that we would expect would come into place for April of next year. So I use the example of smoking cessation services. Yeah, so right. they have been tendered in the past. The legislation as it's set out under current proposals would mean that if there was good reason that wouldn't need to be tendered going forward. So the legislation seeks to not require full tendering for NHS health services unless there's a good reason to do so. But we need to right. see the detail once that legislation's drafted clearly. OK, thank you, Sue. Jenny's got a hand up, Chair. Jenny. Hi, it's just um, they're introducing a duty to collaborate. I just wondered if there's any feeling about what the, what measures they might bring in to make people collaborate, because at some point somebody's going to say no. 
So yeah. has any feeling yet, Sue? Or? I think I think we do. So clearly, a lot of this legislation um, doesn't directly impact on us as a foundation trust, and there's no proposals to change foundation trust legislation. But the context we're in, within which we're working is going to change. So the way that I think that will be enacted is not necessarily, and, and this is just the, the legislative proposals, but when we look at what CQC are proposing and some of the regulatory changes that are going to happen to support this agenda, it will come in through that process. So already there is a requirement um, through that regulation for a level of collaboration. I think that will just get emphasised more so. And what the um, CQC, for example, is doing is it's going to be looking at um, patches as opposed to individual organisations. So it, as you know, is going through its own consultation on how it changes to support this agenda and to learn from all the stuff that has happened during COVID. But I suspect it will impact on us most directly um, from a kind of stat point of view, not from legislation, but through regulation and through what is being planned from a CQC perspective. Part of the reason I shared the stuff about the GPs is I think we're in a good place for that collaboration. And later on today, we talk about in both the Durham and Darlington locality, the um, partnership executives that we have in both of those patches and the work that's being done at place. And I think that's going to be crucial in terms of making the intent of these changes as they're set out in the white paper um, work in practice. And the white paper itself does um, is clear that legislation is only a tiny fragment of what it's trying to achieve as it sets the, the NHS on a course over the next 10 years to fundamentally um, shift, I guess, the health largely of the population, because we've been providing really good health services, but some of the underpinning um, metrics around the health of our population have stayed stubbornly static over recent years. Okay, thanks Sue. I just wonder yeah, if everybody else is mature as that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no doubt more on that to come. Um, the ICS, as everybody at the board is um, aware of, we've been in, <clears throat> has been in place for some time. This is the body that will become the statutory body. And what I do over on pages 38 and 39, I just summarise um, what is being looked at. Clearly, a big focus on how does the ICS in a legislative regime that is going to be fairly permissive, best organise itself to deliver its ambition. And our ICS's ambition, as you're already aware, is around that health inequalities and health of our local population. So as well as providing the best in healthcare services, how do we change the dial on some of those wicked problems that despite having fabulous health services, have plagued the people of the North East and um, North Cumbria in terms of their relatively poor health. And we see that particularly when we look through the lens of inequality and um, deprivation. So we see that as a patch and we also see that within our patch. So a lot of our time has been uh, working through how we might organise ourselves as all of these arrangements come into place. You, you'll know that the ICS has a... Just on the, uh, um, the ICS, Sue, the third bullet point to do with the North East and North Cumbria Applied Research Collaborative, which is very positive. Would it be yeah. possible to get a flavour of it? We know that research is, is growing really nicely, particularly within our trust and across the patch. But what was the possibility? positivity about it? So I think that what we're trying to do is um, a lot of the research money that gets allocated across the country nationally ends up going into the big um, conurbations, the, the Londons, the Oxfords, etc. Now we have a strong offering on um, the applied research that we do. We also mm -hmm. have a, in terms of the um, health science network we've got a strong offering there we've got the facility that was opened by newcastle to um, support the um, program of um, testing for covid and linked to that are some um, if you like some academic opportunities so 
this is the beginnings of an agenda that looks at if we start tying all these things together, including the research network, which, as you know, I chair across the region, can we create something that's bigger than the sum of its parts? And I think the view is very strongly that we can. And then how do we attract in um, some of that funding, some of that opportunity that we um, hopefully by organising slightly differently, we can punch above our weight, if that makes sense. Yes, indeed. Paul, you got a question? I think, Paul, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, sir, I'm a bit um, behind the cue ball this morning. Um, just taking you back to the um, proposed leg uh, the legislation changes. It, yeah. It, it would seem with the voting, the way that it was, that it's kind of, it's the worst of all outcomes where, you know, it's kind of symptomatic of a Brexit vote almost where, you know, the, the population split, you know, 50-50 or near enough 50-50, but there are some extreme views at either end of that spectrum. Yeah. Is it, have you any feel for what the voting was locally and whether it was any different? And the second part of my question is, do you think there's likely to be any changes to the legislation as a result of the voting, or are they just, would you imagine, going to carry on regardless? What's your feel for that? So the way this worked is the proposals were, if you like, commented on, hence the votes, before the white paper was issued. So it should have impacted on it. And if we looked at what we thought was going to be in the white paper and what actually came out, I think the one of the, the biggest changes was that as well as having an ICS board, there'd be a partnership group that sits alongside it that includes all partners. And I think, to be honest, there was a very short time to undertake the consultation. And from what's come out both nationally that I've read and some of the local conversations that we've had, it's there's a concern um, that depending on how things are worked through, um, they might not be optimal at place. And I think everybody sees place, which is why I emphasised that and said we'd come to that later, as being the bit of the system where we can have um, almost the best integration and make the biggest difference. Certainly, we have the most contact with our population at that level. And in the proposals, it was unclear exactly how it was all going to be translated. So I think perhaps there was a, a, a level of concern. And as we know from the STPs from a few years ago, they didn't exactly help with the relationships between um, local government and health as it was felt at a national level. I think our relationships locally have always been strong. And as you'll hear later, they're getting stronger and stronger. So I think it's that dynamic between wanting control at place and wanting to understand exactly what an ICS will do. Mm. The legislation itself, as I said, is permissive. So I think we've got it within our gift to craft something for the North East and North Cumbria that makes most sense. And definitely the mood music locally and with the local authorities is that this is a good opportunity for us to work together if it's done well. And to do it well, we need to make sure that we really anchor the localities in how we organise ourselves in and around the legislation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sue. We can um, move on to provider. Yeah, so so provider collaborative. So this is the collaborative of all the main providers across the North East and North Cumbria. And it's here to give you a flavour of the work that we're looking at. Um, you can see it in the paper. I won't um, particularly draw any points out other than to say we're starting to get some successes under our belt. So we are as a group taking um, wicked problems that exist within the system, um, a recent one being the way in which we allocate what is a very restrictive capital programme between providers and um, doing that work on behalf of the ICS rather than that work happening at the ICS, if that makes sense. So um, again, really um, positive beginnings to us working in a way that um, will ensure that the best possible health for the whole of the population that we serve um, is delivered. The other um, example of something that we've been doing in that um, territory is looking at the inequalities 
at, through the lens of our waiting lists. And as everybody knows, waiting lists have got longer because of COVID. We're now working through recovery. So how and when do we collaborate most effectively? And Carol and her colleague who's in the provider collaborative have been doing some work to look at how we optimise that, not only in our locality, but we optimise it across the whole of the North East and North Cumbria. So I think that will become a really strong body as we move forward. And as you've already seen, we've kind of um, determined that we'll be a group that chooses to work together because actually that has a benefit because there's different models that you can migrate towards um, that would um, essentially form what you could call a, co a collaborative, but ours would be a voluntary arrangement where leaders come together to make a significant impact on the health of lo our local populations as well as the health of the whole area that we can do better together than not. So we'll be bringing details of the work plan that we'll be um, looking to do over the course of the next 12 months to you, but two quite positive bits of work in terms of that capital and the work on recovery that we've already started. Just, just two questions, Sue. It makes reference to the number of places uh, of IMTS3 places has been reduced and that's been looked at. What would be the implications for us as a trust? Sorry, that it's probably my poor wording. So we right. considered that there was a shortfall of places. So we've got more doctors <coughs> than we had places. Right. And the result of the work that we did as a collaborative is we've offered all of those doctors places. Right. Now, we yeah. won't know until summer how many will be allocated. But the mm. problem was the deanery potentially had more people to place because of change in the educational right. programme than it had places. Mm. But between us, we've offered the full suite of places. Mm. So that's, again, very positive. It is indeed, yes. Now, that's great, Sue. And my other point on that is the bullet point that starts with agreement to clarify the provider collaborative. I just wonder, because if the provider collaborative is now overseeing clinical strategy across the patch, where does it leave the ICPs and, you know, all the other clinical strategies that have been evolving over the last couple of years? Well, I think this is where it, this is then begging a question, because what we think is we can do this most effectively. So if that is how we organise ourselves, that means that's where the strategy would emanate from. And the ICS, if you like, who has a level of responsibility around health services would leave the work for the collaborative to do. And that's what we're intending. So when so, so at that level, um, I think we think we can with the teams that we have in the providers, the medical directors, our nursing directors, we can make more headway than maybe has been made before. And providing the ICS is comfortable with that, which they've signalled that they are, that's how it'll work. I have shared previously with you, I don't think it's in today's papers, the governance that sits around that. And what that right. shows is what happens at an organisational level versus an ICP level in the way that ICPs are currently constituted, and then how that wraps up into what would then hit, if you like, the provider collaborative agenda, which would be the more wicked um, problems that need a strategy that would work across the whole of the northeast. So things that we're looking at at the minute are cancer services, including oncology services. We've looked at radiology. So the services you'd be familiar with that lend themselves to a regional response to ensure that they're as sustainable as they can be. OK, that's great. Thank you, Sue. Any other questions for Sue on provider collaborative? No, thanks, Sue. Paul's we'll got move on then to the next. Sorry, Paul, I think Paul Foster. Paul. Paul. He has, yes. Paul? Yes, yeah, so just, so just, um, just a, a quick one. Any further update on South Tees, North Tees, merger, chairmanship, you know, getting any closer together, or is it still, still not? So um, in terms of the, the joint chairman, um, has been appointed and I think we're due to have a, a, a wider discussion um, later on um, today as a board um, so I'll be able to go into there's not a lot more detail but um, yes that, that the joint chairman 
which is a, a temporary and interim chairman post was appointed to and uh, we cover that later on okay. in some of the other posts. Thanks, Sue. Right. Thank Collaborative between uh, yeah. North so I'll, I'll, and South. So I'll cover both of these if I can together. So really this is just to, so the ICP still exist and they exist because they were established under the old ICS arrangement. Clearly, as we work towards a new, um, or we work towards defining our ICS under this new legislative programme we've talked about, we need to, alongside our local authority colleagues, work out what is best fit. So we're involved in that work. But in the meantime, the two ICPs continue uh, to meet and the document just gives you a flavour. I suspect that as we go forward, we've talked previously about the LA7 and the LA5, and we might find that there are various different groupings that we're part of. And given the geography of our trust, it's ever been thus. We've been involved in lots of different arrangements um, over the years, some of which fall neatly into um, the stat arrangements that various bodies have. The most um, neat example of that is probably the local resilience forum, but most of which were straddling different arrangements. And we've got very used to working in those um, ways. And I think that that will happen as we go forward, whether the ICP stay in this format or whether they slightly change this sort of discussion around that but they exist at the minute we're playing into them and the work that we're doing unsurprisingly is looking at covid looking at recovery and um also thinking about the um ics and how do you how do you bridge and do you need to bridge between the ics and individual organizations you happy i continue paul yeah, yes, please. I'll, I'll keep yeah. going unless you stop me. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of um, the winter plan, just to say, as you know, our local area delivery board um, looked at the CQC document patient first, which looks at flow and is a cross system and determined that there were no further actions that we require, were required to optimise performance. Carol will come on to some of the good performance we've seen. Um, and it's really just to signpost the board that IQAC is and has now taken a look at that and i'm sure paul will talk uh, sorry that michael will talk about that later on in terms of epr and we've got um, a bit of a discussion on epr later um, but we've held the second transformation program board we've done some work with our internal auditors looking at our state of readiness to embark on this program of work which we're contracted to which will be massively brilliant for clinicians across the organization and our patients but as always with these schemes very complicated um, so through that external work we got a green light from our internal auditors CERNA themselves our supplier do um, gateway reviews at various points so they were assessing us through a slightly different lens their own lens and again we got a really good um, clean bill, bill of health that's a pre-alignment gateway during the course of the um, programme, there'll be a number of gateways that we'll go through. So we'll always be taking a internal independent view through audit as well as the CERNA view as we seek to make sure that we have as smooth an implementation as we can. And the arrangements agreed by the board through which Richard and Steve are providing a level of um, constructive challenge that's now begun yeah. so that's now in place so we'll see this really ratcheting up as you know it really starts to from the end of April you know there'll be big progress to report on this each um, time at board I haven't included the minutes this time round just because they're not very five minutes but I will obviously share full minutes of that meeting with you that's great Sue and I just wondered whether Richard or Steve would want to make a comment are they comfortable the way things are going? Very comfortable the way that things are going uh, there's significant challenge put and uh, great answers at this stage so that's uh, positive. That's great thank yeah. you Richard. I will concur with that Paul. Yeah thank you Steve. Okay so if we move on then to the staff survey I think Michael's sorry, the green, sorry, the green plan. Michael's <laughs> got his hand up, Chair. Oh, sorry. Michael, sorry. 
I'm, I'm desperately trying to lower my hand at the moment. My question was going to be, um, <laughs> will we regularly have sight of the minutes from the EPR board? And you oh, just sorry, yes, yeah, you do. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, okay, moving thank on to, to the green plan. Um, so the board will recall the vision that we've already agreed. Um, we've seen this document in draft before. It's in a really lovely, accessible state. I think now the comms team have done an amazing job on this for which indeed they've received an excellence report but our vision is to ensure that we provide the safest most compassionate and joined up healthcare whilst taking all reasonable steps to minimize the adverse impact on the environment society and the planet thereby not compromising the health and well-being of future generations so we've agreed that as our um, vision what you see is the um, fully um, comms document that we'll be sharing internally and externally so we've agreed that at the sustainability development group um, that met um, and we'll launch this with your approval on the 19th of april so it will be launched i've just put on in the document a number of ways we'll be doing it so a podcast from uh, richard hickson it'll be in the week ahead you won't be able to exist in our part of the world without knowing about our green plan basically in that week and it's quite good because we've got some new bike shelters that happen to um, open then we've then got a whole comm strategy which is aimed at ensuring that um, you can't escape without understanding the agenda and having opportunity to support it we'll be doing that by linking into a lot of national and international events plastic free july there's a recycle week coming up in september i think importantly in september we'll be doing a pulse survey within the organization mm. and what that will allow us to identify is how well and how saturated have we been able to get and how motivating have we been able to be in getting people to know that this agenda is there and actually contribute to it. So that will be the first point at which the board gets a feel for how successful we've been in winning hearts and minds. In the meantime, what will happen going forward is for each of the objectives, there's a set of measurables and there's a, a set of interdependencies. So what the board will see, whether it's on the hoping to do around mileage which we've already proven during covid can be very successfully achieved through to um, reductions in waste what you'll get is progress that maps um, how well we're doing with our ambition the document sets out that ambition over three years we've put targets in place for each of those three years so you'll be able to see um, whether or not we're on track and the board kindly agreed this as a, an additional um, objective linked to the board assurance framework. So you'll be seeing it principally through that, but we'll put some quarterly reporting into you that gives you a bit more detail. Michael, you got a question? I don't have a question actually, Chairman, just a, a comment. And uh, every time I put my hand up, Sue jumped straight to the point I was going to make. So she <laughs> clearly mind reading. <laughs> I was going to refer to the, uh, the the long wait we've had really in getting the bath uh, completed and commend the plan because I think it's um, I've seen quite a few green plans around and you know there is the term greenwash which is you know that the, we just do it in name only um, I, I think that the plan is concise it's very easy to read it's going to uh, appeal to a very wide audience and I think it's achievable it, it's got some uh, real flesh on it. So I was really pleased to see it. Just wanted to pass that commendation along. Thanks, Thanks Michael. I would echo your comments. Absolutely. Excellent document and uh, congratulations again to the communication team for the way it's been presented. It really is very, very practical in its approach. Yeah. Can I just make a comment on page eight of the document that's attached? Why have we got the Latin uh, motto? And if we have got a Latin motto, can we have a, a translation? It's, that's just the default holding text, isn't it's, it? It is. It's a default text, uh, Jenny, so it will be updated. Don't yeah. ask me to say what it means in Latin because I've got no idea. <laughs> <Long -up some. laughs> I don't know, even in law, we only had like short little comments. <laughs>
Thanks. Thanks, Sue. Can move on then to uh, obviously it's the staff survey. Yes, yeah, so th this is not the full um, exposition that you'll get of staff survey. Morven and her team will bring that along and you've hopefully already seen this through internal communication, but there was a couple of things that I wanted to make sure we had registered um, at the board. Um, so the first is headline messages along the theme scores. That's on page 43. Um, team working disappointingly, the only one that had moved significantly from previously. But as you'll have seen from the text, that's happened really across the country and is probably in part to do with the fact that a lot of people have been redeployed and so haven't been working within their normal teams over the point at which this polled, this polled from the um, late in September to November. But the main reason I wanted to bring it is um, we had a full staff survey this year and we were um, all exceptionally disappointed in what was uh, what came through in terms of the responses from our BAME colleagues. I know BAME is a horrible word um, and uh, there was discussion in the media today about us not using it, but that's the word that's used within the staff survey um, currently. So whilst when we were polling everybody about equality and diversity, we did well, as you'll see from the themes. When you then extract for certain questions um, from BAME colleagues, their experience of the trust compared to that of um, white counterparts, there is a significant and negative difference in many cases. And in some cases, we are different to the national position, which generally is disappointing. Um, in some cases, our own position is um, not as good as the national position if you look at that gap between white and um, BAME experience. This involves um, bullying and harassment from both colleagues, from patients and relatives, and um, the opportunities that um, our BAME staff believe they have in, their, in the organisation compared to the views of our white staff. So we are exceptionally disappointed. We've been very clear about this. We've issued statements from the outset. We've um, shared this through our closed Facebook group and we have set out a statement of intent jointly, uh, myself, the chair of our BAME network and um, the senior staff side rep. We've had some really good support from Richard who might want to come um, in on this, but I think um, it's, you know, we are exceptionally disappointed about that experience. We are absolutely determined that that is not um, going to be allowed to persist and we have begun work as is set out for you to ensure that's the case. But I'm sure, Richard, you'd want to make a comment. Um, I know the board are absolutely um, committed to making sure staff are well supported under this situation and have hit the ground running. Um, I, in my role, are constantly in contact with the sort of key leaders in that setting and it does need to be said that those key leaders and the people they're supporting are taking this as an opportunity to build properly and for the long term within the trust and to not only take this as good for the trust but to use this trust as an exemplar for the rest of the NHS as a whole so there is a lot of positivity that's gone with it, it does also need to be said that from the centre, the larger organisations that look to BAME issues and inclusivity and diversity in general have noted that the Trust has got this in its staff survey in light of the RES and the DES, and particularly they've taken note of Darlington. So I've been handling some of that and telling them just how committed the board are, the leaders are, and uh, especially the CEO and the chair. So I think there's a lot of positivity that's going to come from it. It will take time, but I know the resources are there. OK, Paul, you've got a question. Paul. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. 
Daisy, I've, Daisy, I'm trying to ask a question. <laughs> Sorry, um, she's completely thrown me this. <laughs> well, what I was trying to ask was that I'm mean, clearly dealing with this. But my wife's chased her outside, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, I mean, it's a, huge, it's a hugely complicated issue, so, but I wondered, uh, you know, other than issuing sort of public pronouncements and, and, and wanting to change things, are there sort of real tangible, you know, steps that we can yeah. take, even baby steps to, to actually do, to do something that's, you know, got a meaningful impact now sort of thing? Yeah, so, th so the network um, is um, not the only bit of, if you like, infrastructure that we've got. We've got a, a team within Morvan's department. But the first thing, um, uh, to, to echo what Richard says, that the, the, there is a really positive um, approach that's being taken right across the board, whether it's staff side, the network, the trust, about what we can do and the practical steps which really fall out of the intent if you've had time to see the statement itself mm. are to look at uh, to start exploring um why are some of those views the views that are being held and what is it that's happening underneath the skin of that so that we can take positive and proactive action so i'm looking in morvan's direction because i think that survey has already gone out it's gone out this week hasn't it because i've seen it so you get limited information on the National Staff Survey, Paul, as to why, because it's mainly just answering, you know, across a um, Leichhardt scale. So the first action is to get a better feeling from across the whole of the organisation. That's gone out this week and you'll see a number of things that happen across the year. And given, you know, the board's interest in this and the benefit that will arise from the work we do, in this for everyone will will keep you closely advised as all those actions start to um, take a, a, a grip within the organization okay thanks sue just on that obviously the the statements from the uh, board are very very clear in terms of our commitment to resolve this but i just wonder sue, if you could just give you you've referred to actions that we're going to take to yeah. to resolve this matter and to make sure that our equality and diversity is absolutely at, at the highest possible standard as this is an open board meeting if you could just summarize some of the actions we're going to take in conjunction with richard to to resolve that matter i will so i think the first thing to say is that um our equality diversity and inclusion agenda covers other groups as well as um bame i'm picking bame out because they the, the results mm -hmm. and what we saw through staff survey are different and more negative for bame so i'll talk about the bame agenda but that doesn't mean you know we're doing work in all those there's, there's two other groups we're, we're doing work there so the first thing is to say that we've got a network um, that is looking at this so we're not starting from no action at all because these networks have been established. I think it's fair to say that they've had, like everything else, a bit of an interruption to what they've been able to do this year because of COVID. The main thing that we're trying to do around the BAME is first of all, be really over with our statement of intent. We want the experience of everyone in this organisation, whether it's around the opportunities you face or whether it's the way that you are treated by your colleagues or by our patients and relatives to be the same there should be no difference so i think being up front and stating that and being out there around it and communicating that is the first thing to do really overtly we have signed up um, to the bame promise a few months ago probably six months ago which exists across the region but we're doing this more publicly and pushing this out more in our organization we're encouraging people if they experience discrimination to come forward we're providing them with details of how they can do that we're also um, seeking through the survey that i've just mentioned our own survey to understand what is it that means that those bame staff um, are reporting that they have a poorer chance of opportunities within the organization so that we can then understand it and work through how to address it so I think they're the I think that survey is going to yeah. 
allow us to understand it much better and the network really wants to understand it themselves because I think that we've not really had opportunity to do it so a lot of actions will drive from that but in the meantime we're being really overt saying if you're experiencing something that you shouldn't we won't stand for it and this is a range of ways in which you can raise this within the organization. Thanks Sue. Richard? I mean, just simply to add to what Sue said right at the end, this is a bottom up approach. It's the folk, it's the main folk we have who drive this. It's their experiences. They need to be the ones in control. It's not for the board to say you will do this, you will do that. It needs to come from them. And Morven and her colleagues have been fantastic in helping me as an oversight get an idea of that. So um, that's really where it needs to come from. That's great. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Sue. If we can move on then to the next item. Yes, Page just four. a great um, a great week, really, because the, the report tells you about the colon capsule endoscopy and how we're um, pioneering that and um, in, in doing so being part of a study that's running through York. But um, at the time of writing, I didn't know, but we've also done one. I'm looking in Jeremy's direction for the... Um, uh, not for the colon, for the ba for higher up the um, GI tract, the small <laughs> bowel. That's the word I'm looking for. So that we did, we've done our first uh, patient for both of these um, within the last um, week. So that's great because it's allowing um, patients to access something that's at the uh, more leading edge and um, avoid some of the invasive arrangements and that is particularly important given some of the restrictions around COVID. It's a bit of good news. I've included the report from the Director of Public Health from County Durham just so that you um, are cited on it. Clearly we're on the Health and Wellbeing Board. That's where the that has various committees that sit underneath it. That's how we help to influence and contribute to it. The way these reports work they always feel like they're slightly late because this one relates to 1920. But we'll come on later this afternoon to talk a bit more about that collaboration, which I've already signposted with both County Durham and Darlington. And then finally, on this report, Shotley Bridge, just that there has been a um, engagement exercise that has con now concluded and um, is closed. And I'll be able to report more on that um, later on today. But um, Needless to say that despite the COVID restrictions, actually, we managed to engage very significantly um, around that and um, there'll be more of that to come. But the, as, you, as your board members will recall, Shotley Bridge Hospital is due to be um, re-provided and the engagement was around options about how that re-provision may be best um, attained. Mm. Just on the Shotley Bridge one, as Sue, it says the completion date is early 2021. That that should be 2022, should it? Um, the business case will be autumn 2021. It should, because if we were somehow writing the business case and then finishing the actual build <laughs> earlier, yes, yes, well spotted. That's my fault, mea culpa. No, not at all, no. So uh, just before we move on, on the um, the public health report, obviously uh, a very detailed report and, and getting very well produced. But what is of particular concern, lots of concerns in it, but 10,000 children uh, will be suffering from mental health problems. Another 10,000 suffering from obviously um, disability problems of one nature or another. So clearly as a trust, we're cognizant of that. And uh, obviously we'll come on to again later on talking about workforce, as I mentioned earlier on, but uh, a great report, but significant implications for us as an organisation. And as you say, the collaboration is even more crucial going forward because of that report. Yeah. But before we move on to the next item on your agenda, Sue, I would like on behalf of the board to thank you and congratulate you and your executive team and all our colleagues within the trust for the Northern Echo Awards we received this week. It's a huge accolade for our organisation. And as you mentioned, it's really, really another step in the right direction. So many, many thanks to you and the executive team and everybody else concerned. 
it's really good news for us. Well, unfortunately, Paul, I know you're mm. not able to be with us as non-execs, but we're all sat here with a nice big cake to celebrate after mm. the board. So never. We'll be tucking well, it. <laughs> you could send us a piece in the post. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On that note, so we'll move on then to the, uh, I think it's the Care Quality Commission update. It is. There's just a couple of things that I want to pick out. Warren's kindly pulled this together and he might want to go into uh, more detail. But the points I wanted to raise were, um, one, in relation to the two must-dos that are described as ongoing, um, which are really about opportunities for optimising the services within ED and uh, front of house for um, children's services. I just wanted to assure the board that the the kind of um, basic um, improvements that we um, agreed to make, which was about increasing the numbers of staff and looking at the pathways we've largely achieved. But in looking at these recommendations as time has moved on, we see further opportunities. So you'll know that the inspection was just before the PAU opened at um, Durham and that has reopened post COVID as you're aware but the facilities in Darlington are still um, being that they're under construction currently so what I didn't want um, you to get the um, impression of is that there wasn't some really good progress but as you know that we've added in a sense to um, the um, actions on the back of further improvements that we have been able to identify post the inspection, post sharing our action plan back with CQC. Warren and his team, I think, are going to just do a bit of work for us, um, confirming um, those pathways from a compliance point of view are as we're being advised. We've got no reason to suggest that they're not um, but I just wanted to emphasize that because you haven't got any detail in the report to really um, see that in terms of the full document and the second point was really the one I referred to before that whilst the board wasn't able to undertake its original board development program because of COVID and all the changes that that has brought what we've done when you look back is probably do quite a lot of board development in different ways and I'd ask Warren to pull that together and he's done a high level summary of that. I think that is a draft pulling together so it's not, um, it, it's certainly indicative and representative of what we've done but not necessarily comprehensive. So what we will do is pull together a comprehensive um, list of all the work that we've done over the last year just so that we've got that lodged and uh, Warren um, as we've discussed has got his um, sights firmly on our plan for this year which involves some more basic training to begin with but more developments deve developmental uh, matters as we go through so they were the two things that I just wanted to pull out and emphasize but Warren I'm sure there's other pieces that we should yeah, I think just to give the board uh, assurance, first of all, um, in terms of um, the last two engagement meetings, in fact, because we also had one with CQC yesterday, um, that um, uh, both of those meetings have been um, uh, fine in terms of um, our ability to provide the information CQC have requested, and um, they've confirmed in both meetings that we're not flagging uh, on their risk radar. Um, we have satisfied them in terms of the, uh, the progress of um, the, the things that they routinely refer to us um, because um, local authorities or members of the public go to them. Um, and so in terms of ongoing inquiries, there are some follow up points from myself and Emma, but they're just of a routine nature. Uh, and in terms of our response to some of the, the um, more substantive queries that the board's aware of from previous meetings, they are content with where that's going. Uh, I've appended the response to CQC's um, strategy. So I think Sue's already alluded to uh, their direction of travel um, in terms of supporting and regulating systems as well as providers. Um, and clearly um, what they're looking also to do is to increase their focus on the needs of communities and patients 
and how they regulate against that. They're looking, as we've all wanted them to do for some time, to be smarter in terms of how they use data, evidence, uh, update risk assessments uh, and update ratings. They are going to maintain a very strong focus on SAFE, which I think uh, we would all agree with, um, and uh, to seek to drive improvement both through working across systems and also um, in relation to um, broader items affecting health, such as health inequalities. Um, in terms of the comments that we provided, we're supportive of that direction of travel. Clearly, there's a lot of devil in the detail for implementation of that, including development of appropriate skills, how they consider the evidence base and make sure it's reliable, avoiding confirmation bias, uh, how they recognise good or outstanding practice as well. So, um, but but certainly direction of travel that we welcome, and we can tell even from the engagement meetings that some of the things that they talk about in that publication and in other publications in terms of ongoing monitoring of risk and more dialogue and wanting to understand our own data sources are already starting to come through, which I think is, is positive. We've shared the um, transitional key lines of inquiry um, in relation to um, CQC's areas of interest at the moment, and I've appended um, something which I've extracted from their latest bulletin, which summarises their current regulatory approach. It's nothing new, it just reaffirms what Sue's talk told the board previously in terms of how they're continuing to um, do their work with um, acute and community providers in particular based on risk and the risk and, and the areas they're most interested in, which we're bringing through IQAC one by one, having done maternity and patient first, those two areas plus infection prevention and control, which will be the, the next one to come to IQAC next month. That's, it. That's great. Thanks. Any questions for Sue or Warren? Can I just ask a question? And I'm sure there'll be a very good rationale for it. It's in relation to paediatric specialist staff and paediatric nursing. And again, it crops up under the BAF risk register later on to do with SCABU, neonatal, and that shortage of paediatric nursing. Uh, I am aware that we over recruited paediatric nursing in recent times. And I just wondered why, if we've over recruited, why there's still a shortage of that speciality within A and E and SCABU, et cetera. So we've over recruited against the ward establishments. Um, I don't think we ever recruited. I'm looking at, at Noel in terms of against SCABU. I don't think we've no, over recruited. That's, that's so SCABU separate. So we over recruited against the ward establishments. I think within ED, it's to do with these pathways and because the services are operating the PAUs for 12 hours currently, what happens outside of those 12 hours and how A&E is geared up with paediatric staff to cover. And that's what was the, if you like, the ongoing work that I referred to before, Paul. Right. Okay. But we remain over-established in the wards, is my understanding. Right. Yeah. But they're no longer open. Oh, they're no, not anymore. So they are at establishment, are they? So, so the wards are now at establishment, not yeah, over. We are continuing to make indicative offers to paediatric graduates for the September cohort, given that we're now in March. We don't consider there to be any financial stake whatsoever, either given the level of turnover. Right. So, so Noel's just updating to say we did over recruit about a year ago. It was about this time, wasn't it? February time, I think. Um, but we're mm -hmm. now at establishment, not over. OK, thank you. If there's no other questions for on care quality. Question, it's just Sorry? a practical question, oh. Paul. Mm -hmm. um, it's just I, I have attended a couple of um, online seminars. Uh, Warren, do I just send the details to uh, Pete for the board development stuff? Yes, please, Jenny. Yeah, I'm doing one tomorrow on charities, I think. <laughs> OK, thanks. OK, that will move on to the board assurance framework. Yeah, again, I'll let, uh, you know, Warren spent a lot of time producing this. There's just a couple of things I want to quickly touch on. One is we haven't had chance this time round for this and the results of this to be um, discussed at the relevant subcommittees. So we'll do that between now and April and provide any feedback from that into the April board. The other thing that I think um, in terms of when you're looking at this report and Warren and I have had a brief discussion about it is if you look at page 
112.4 where you get the movement so which risks are improving where there's no change and where there's deterioration what that doesn't really demonstrate is a lot of the progress so if you take the risk around um, preventing the spread of covid to patients and staff we've done an awful lot since you last saw this it hasn't at this point in accordance with the way that we've assessed the risk changed the risk itself because that's you know it, it that that has a limited number of times that you're able to change it because of the way we score but there's been some positive progress so we are going to add another column onto that next time so you can see whether there is positive progress being made um, or not and as Warren will come on to you'll see that mainly we're in line with our uh, risk trajectories but I just think it would help re the reader of this report if we included something to signal um, that um, sort of sense of direction. The uh, My final point is just you hopefully the board have noted that there's quite a significant um, change to the risk register and as the board knows through previous sessions the executive have met with each of the care groups to discuss um, separately governance arrangements it's each of the care groups risk registers and we've also done that for the corporates and the early plans for next year so some of the um, improvements consolidations in the risk register have arisen out of that process and some of them as you'll have noted from the commentary are um, signaled to be um, amended and haven't quite um, for the um, timetable for this board that hasn't quite happened but it's signaled in the action column but I'll let Warren go over the substantive report. Thanks Sue so there has been a, a full update of the document in terms of um, first of all bringing the controls up to date because of the transitional um, state that we've been in um, in terms of managing the pandemic and coming out the back of that um, right the way through to the sources of assurance and the assurance outcomes and although there hasn't been the opportunity for the collective executive review. There have been discussions with each executive owner of, of the individual objectives. Um, overall, uh, 18 out of the 19 objectives are being risk managed in line with the trajectories that the board has agreed um, and none have deteriorated in terms of the risk scores. Two have actually um, improved. Uh, one is in relation to outcomes from COVID uh, and the um, uh, second one is in relation to finance for the current year. Um, one, we weren't able to bring the risk score down in uh, line with trajectory. So we felt it would be uh, imprudent, which was Noel's view and my own, in relation to the minimising harm objective. Um, the trajectory was set to be stretching, uh, particularly uh, in a year with other things that we've had to manage um, and to um, Put, put us in a position essentially where we would be saying that we would have a low uh, likelihood uh, of a moderate or major harm right across the board. Um, and that's quite stretching, as you know, in terms of the tests that we apply uh, in terms of how we would define lo low likelihood based on our risk matrix. Um, given that we're only emerging from the most recent wave of, of COVID infections, uh, we have had uh, higher levels of um, healthcare acquired infections than uh, our own ambitions, albeit that nationally we still benchmark reasonably. Uh, and we also have an emerging risk, which uh, plays, I think, to one of your comments earlier, Paul, in relation to um, mental health uh, and how it's affecting things like um, presentations of um, children and adolescents with, with issues, including eating disorders that Noel's working very closely with Chuvon, we felt it would be imprudent to reduce that, that risk score at this stage. Um, there are, and the document provides you with the details, some others that are still sitting at 12, um, which is a high amber and, and one red risk, um, which we've discussed many times at the board and that has a huge amount of focus um, that we'll, you'll hear later in the meeting and you've heard in previous meetings in relation to recovery of activity uh, and uh, addressing backlogs in particular. Um, what we will be looking to do um, is clearly um, we have a separate COVID section at this buff at the moment. We need to reset it. We need to, to um, reintegrate that section uh, into the other principal business objectives. 
And in doing that, what I would uh, want to try and explore is whether I can take the advice I've received from the Good Governance Institute, which is to um, try and improve the alignment between the BAF and um, how we define our strategic objectives as we update the strategy handbook and to explore the possibility of having a strategic risk register that takes more of the um, the action planning and ownership um, not out of this document but presented in a way that complements it um, where it, it can be more clearly explored in terms of what progress are we making with actions even if actually the control position the assurance position hasn't moved yet possibly um, helping to, to address the issue that Sue has raised uh, I'll stop there. Um, there's a lot of detail in the document. I'm happy to take any questions. Anybody got any observations, questions? No. I've just got a question or two. It's in the operational section, Warren, yeah. and it's on page 112.32, and it's the uh, item 1983. So good year. Uh, at the end of that section, it says staff have reported some new health issues. Now, I assume that those health issues were in relation to the equipment and nothing to do with individual staff. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a misnomer in the way that the care group have, 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 have entered the, the risk description there. It is indeed with the uh, equipment, Paul. Uh, and okay. It's the consequence of if, if the equipment isn't available right when you need it, the ability to bring people into their procedures. It's not health issues affecting staff. Right. OK, thanks for that. And my other one is in relation to, um, <clears throat> well, I've mentioned about Skibu and staffing, but Noel has already responded to that. It's the last item on page 112.38. And again, I mentioned this before to do with medical gases and I know that's been corrected and there's going to be an annual check but in light of the fact of the seriousness of it it says there will be an annual review carried out on the equipment and it's just I'm not an engineer but is an annual review enough in light of the seriousness of medical gases into Skibu and that? Um. So the, the risk will have been assessed um, and, and maybe Alison might, might have a comment on this, but the risk will have been assessed um, not only in terms of the, the, the um, operational care groups, but with reference to the advice of the authorising engineer for those right. systems. So um, if I would expect that um, that frequency would have been agreed with the authorising engineer, but it's something that if, if um, uh, we can't confirm here today, looking in Alison's direction, we will double check. OK, thank you. We've got no other questions. If there's no other questions on that, it, it's time to move on. But I just wonder, do people want a couple of minutes to refresh their coffee? Paul, oh, Michael's, my, got, my, his Michael's got his hand up. Michael, yeah, and sorry. Up as well. <laughs> uh, it's... Um, it's almost announcing a very technical question on just on the operation of BAFs in general. If you look at um, page 112.11, which is objective three, and I'm just looking at the inherent current and target risk position. Um, given that our, our risk tolerance, our highest acceptance of risk is nine, how can you have a target risk that's above that? You can um, you, you can operate outside of your tolerance if, as a board, you know that uh, you may need to do so for a period of time, and uh, that was essentially the situation that um, when uh, we did the whole reset of, of the BAP, first of all with executive directors last summer, uh, and then subsequently um, in discussions with the board, Michael, for this particular objective, um, we felt. Um, given that um, it was one of the COVID objectives and we were therefore only looking at, at a one year window that we would have to operate beyond uh, tolerance because we would we would not. And, uh, and, and this was going to be the same not for everybody nationally, not just for the trust. We would not be able to ad address uh, the build up of the waiting lists and um, the increase in the waiting times for patients within the year. I think had this been one of those where um, we had 
either at the time or at some point during the year uh, done the reset and, 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 and said it's going to become more business as usual and how far out do we go, then clearly the trajectory would at some point um, have, have looked to see reductions from 16 down towards a target score that would have been in line with tolerance. Yeah, I do understand that. I, I, I was wondering really whether um, in the introduction, you know, when you talk about risk appetite and risk tolerance on 112.8, whether that table should have been adjusted yeah. so that it basically says care pathway is 16 and there's a, a line saying due to exceptional circumstances, we've had to go yeah. beyond our usual tolerance. That's all I was meaning. OK, thank you, Michael. If there are no other questions, do people want a couple of minutes to refresh their coffee? Good. Good. OK, we'll take a few minutes break then and refresh your coffee or do whatever you need to do and we'll resume in about five minutes. If you're ready and you've enjoyed the cake, or at least some of you did, we, we will continue and just remind again about the declaration of interest. So we move on to the COVID-19 item number five. Thanks, Chair. So in the interest of time, I won't go through all of it, but just no. I think it's generally it's we've got an improving picture. We're down to um, 19 COVID cases in the trust today. Um, the amount of COVID in ITU has been dropping significantly and is very stable. In terms of our communities in County Durham, we've got infection rate at 64.9. That's been going down for a long time positivity rate 2.6% and in Darlington where it has looked as if our infection rates were going up there was a problem with pillar 2 testing so nothing to do with the trust and Darlington's restated figures are down at 83.3 100,000 with positivity at 4.1. In this context clearly we and others are looking very much forward to recovery and we did stand up the elective programme that we've advised you of before as planned. Mm -hmm. We're also, um, we've stood down some of the internal arrangements that we had in place when we were seeing higher numbers of COVID. So we've stood down the clinical gold and within the wider system, um, the LRF arrangements um, that link to the strategic coordinating group which covers fire police ourselves and primary care etc we are standing those arrangements down to meet so that they'll still exist but meet less frequently from the middle of april so that's all really in response to the lower numbers mm -hmm. um, as the board will recall but it wasn't announced in time to include in this paper the national incident level is now down to level three and that essentially means that there's regional coordination and control rather than national. And that's because, as you all know, we've all been seeing the same thing broadly happen across the country. We continue to look at um, quality and safety. And um, there's a, a note in there under 3.2 about the mortality reviews, and they continue to be um, in the overwhelming majority for those that are COVID um, rated um, for care good um, and better. So they're very positive and there's nothing that we're really picking up. The arrangements that we made in terms of the way that we manage patients within the um, hospital settings and various ward settings that we changed in January have led to those drops in nosocomial infections and that has looked positive even at points where our overall numbers of COVID were still um, very high. In terms of us scaling back it, sometimes as the numbers get smaller it is still quite tricky to make sure we've got the right number of COVID and non-COVID beds but the tactical arrangements we've had in place have really supported that being um, done very effectively and as we plan into next year and we'll come to this later on the agenda we're looking at um, how that would work um, under the assumption that we don't have another peak but we're always mindful that that's possible so we will be 
um, doing and um, ensuring that the arrangements, if we do need to stand anything back up, are there and ready. In line with everything else, the staff that are absent have reduced. Um, we've been, in terms of the clinically extremely vulnerable staff, shielding is due to end at the end of this month, in fact, today. So we've been reaching out to ensure that any of those staff that are to come back in to work where that's appropriate and they wish to, that there's the um, appropriate arrangements that are followed in terms of um, ensuring that's a safe process. We've also just on the page 118, were as part of supporting um, staff and polling staff on the health and well-being offer there's been um, really strong feedback that they appreciate peer-to-peer -peer support as opposed to somebody coming in and um, doing that so we have got a plan to introduce trim trauma risk management training a process that the military use and um, is used where individuals are exposed to high stress and trauma so we're seeking to train people to do that within the organization and um, we'll do some evaluation of that but that should give us a team that can be used on an ongoing basis and not just um, you know by pulling stuff uh, teams in to do stuff with us specifically on COVID. Vaccination we're in the middle of doing all of the second doses that has gone well We've also um, been working on ensuring that anybody who has not apparently had a vaccination from within the trust, that first of all, our records are correct because some colleagues who have not had the vaccination through ourselves have had that through other arrangements such as their local GP. And we are and have just completed a work piece of work where there should have been an individual conversation with anybody who's chosen not to have a vaccine and um, that they will have had made available to them all of the relevant information such that they can um, consider that in discussion. We do know from some of those conversations that there's a few hundred staff who are coming forward for first vaccinations within the trust, which we are doing internally. By the end of this week, um, stroke next week, we should have a detail on the numbers. The numbers currently are standing at 81, but we know they're understated, 81%. Mm -hmm. We know we hit just over 90 for flu vax. I would have thought we'll get similar for COVID, um, maybe even higher, but we'll be able to um, advise you of that. We've also been working through, in terms of those conversations, what we might do to have a further clinical opportunity for anyone who still has reservations about the vaccine to have a clinical conversation should they wish. And um, Noel and Edward, um, our public health consultant, are um, and have expressed a, a happiness to facilitate um, any of those conversations for relevant staff. So it would be great if we um, get well into the 90s. According to the information we can see at the minute, we're about in line with other organisations, but I'm not, if I'm honest, convinced that the vaccination information that we all receive yeah. is, yeah. you know, as accurate and up to date as ultimately it will get to, to be. Um, we've talked about the um, assurance and risk log through the discussion on BAF, so I won't come on to say anything more about that. We do continue to support care homes principally with vaccination at um, the minute. And Carol will either take now or later the constitutional targets, because I think some of them are in the, yeah, Carol's going to take that part in her performance report. Right. But you'll have, you'll have noticed that we're, as we've seen COVID numbers come down um, and as we've got good flow um, in the um, two hospitals um, that have the ED departments Durham and Darlington we've seen our ED performance increase I'm sure Carol will touch on that the report then just concludes with um, a very high level update on operational reset so blue and shaded things are either, uh, sorry blue and shaded are done um, shaded is not to be done shortly green is good um, amber is proceeding okay red there are some issues which we will come back to 
later because the issues are mainly around constrained capital um, as well as um, some constraints around construction teams given that there's a lot of um, work not just in our sector that's happening um, as a result of I guess some of the pauses in the pandemic so if you're happy chair will come back to those under the um, conversation we've got later on capital one mm -hmm. one thing to stress is that that said all of these schemes are regardless of the capital state of each of them um, proceeding um, in terms of the clinical service albeit some of it's in at the minute more constrained constrained estate and i think carol will touch on some of the benefits we think we're seeing early doors in those but we've got a process um, for looking at all of those schemes as a collective against their objectives and rather than doing a PIR after say 12 months post implementation review we're going to be reviewing those schemes as they progress so that we can um, ensure that we support those that are having the biggest impact and I shall stop at that point. That's, that's great, that's great. Thanks, thanks for you, for you. That's, that's very great very helpful and reassuring news just on page 14 it's just a a, a technical second par penultimate par paragraph it says we've got two and a half thousand staff over 52 weeks that should be people i think it should yes yeah. it would be worrying if we had yeah. a half thousand staff you know i think yeah. it's 2600 okay any questions for sue on covid no OK, on that, then we shall move well, on to waving his hand. Sorry, sorry, oh, Paul. Oh, sorry. Richard, sorry. Um, could, yeah, right, there's a bit of a cut out on the trim. Um, that sounds very good for staff. Could you just say that again? So I just got that the trauma risk management training. Yeah, so the idea which came from some discussions that were had within ITU and with um, Jeremy was that the military provide a level of training when people have been exposed to things that are traumatic which is really what's happened within the trust the trim training is to train people to facilitate those peer-to-peer -peer discussions that happen in the likes of the military and the reason we've chosen to adopt that approach as opposed to getting someone to come in or signposting our staff to go out to some resource because there's lots of resources that are available is we asked staff what they felt about all of the health and well-being resource that has been made available to them over the last year and they have expressed a preference for peer-to-peer -peer support within the organization that also allows us to have and develop some skills within those staff that we can use in other you know for other uh, matters should we um, experience them and not just for what this is principally being um, this training is principally being done around COVID but it will help in other situations so you know an incident in theatres that might be traumatic you know individual events that happen um, so it should give us something that allows us to have a, a good additional string to our bow going forward as well as helping us with support for staff around COVID. No that's, oh. that's impressive oh, support sorry. for staff. Mm. Okay Paul yeah, thank you, um, Paul. I, I was just concerned, just thinking through the implications of, you know, you know I mean, ha, ha, have, have we thought through, for example, what would happen when, if we get to a situation where we get down to a, a relatively low number of uh, customer, uh, sorry, patient-facing people who refuse to be vaccinated and aren't persuadable? What what happens then if? Um, you know, we get clinicians or nurses or even people like porters who who come in, you know, relatively close contact with patients and, and have religious reasons or ethical reasons or or other reasons for that matter that I don't understand. Um, what, what do we do then? So at the minute, there are those people and they are working with all the relevant PPE and vaccination is not a requirement for that, nor does vaccination allow you to operate differently, whether you're vaccinated or not, because it's not clearly 100%. So I think it's inevitable because we don't get everyone flu vaxxed. I think the interesting national debate that's happening is around care homes and at what point and do ever 
um, the NHS get mandated to have a um, for staff to have a vaccination. It it it's never happened around flu. Um, so uh, I, I don't know where that argument will go, but um, I know it's being had around the care home sector with the no job, no jobs discussion that's happening. So we'll, we'll just have to see. We're in step with um, all national guidance um, in terms of what we're doing. And obviously we are adhering to all the relevant PPE for staff that have not been vaccinated that are still um, that are working with us. OK. Mm -hmm. Are we happy with it? I know that there isn't a better the better answer, but it's it's not. I think we personally it's what it is, isn't it, I suppose, but feel so. that, that vaccination is really important and that, you know, we would personally, I'm sure, each think it would be great if the whole organisation got vaccinated. But there'll be different reasons why people right. don't. And... OK. Nothing else on COVID. We shall move on to integrated quality assurance. Michael. Thanks, Paul. Um, before I actually do the IQAC preface, could I just update the board with respect to um, follow on from the Ockenden review? And I know yes, Noel's got a paper among his many papers later, which, which does a lot of the detail here. But um, I did meet um, with Noel, with Catherine Byrne, Anne Holt, and Joe Crawford to discuss not only the implementation of the Ockenden report, but in particular the letter that came in on the 11th of January from the uh, Chief Maternity Officer, Officer and the National Clinical Director for Maternity, um, which is effectively not putting a hold on things, but telling trusts uh, to take their time until uh, a national model emerges and a national picture emerges. And in that meeting, we looked around the, uh, the evolving approach to the advocacy role, which has changed quite noticeably Mm -hmm. uh, from the publication of the report to the, if you like, emerging guidance. Uh, we discussed the likely structure by which I could fulfil the uh, the role of the NED um, with respect to maternity safety. Um, we looked at it to, to see if there was any emerging good practice, either locally or nationally, that we could follow. And we, we sort of confirmed, we received assurance, if you like, that the gap analysis had been completed and that the implementation of the immediate and essential actions from the review was going well. And I think we'd, I did receive assurance on that. I think it was a very positive meeting. Um, and we agreed an, an interim arrangement as things emerge, where on a bi-monthly basis, I'll meet with the that team of people I mentioned earlier um, mm -hmm. to re receive assurance on, on progress. And we've got to schedule that to sort of fit around IQAC uh, for convenience of all involved. So I just thought we'd get that into the record because that was a, uh, a national mm -hmm. recommendation. And then moving on to IQAC, um, you can see there that we received assurance, we discussed the reports, they're described there as routine assurance reports, they're covered in um, items seven, eight and nine on, on this morning's agenda. Um, I think the board should note that for some of those reports, more detail is coming today than actually went to the committee this time. I think it's probably a matter of timing. Um, you can see that the um, key points were around uh, PPE, about complaints handling and uh, long waiting electives uh, were, were particular elements of discussion. We had an excellent discussion regarding CDDFT quality insight, which I think is becoming a particularly strong tool. Um, do recommend it, very easy to um, take a helicopter view of uh, the important developments in the trust and to get a very good feel for quality across and, and if you like, guide your um, questions for assurance beneath it. And we looked at the perfect ward results, which have been mentioned in the COVID report there. I, th I think the committee should be aware, the board should be aware that perfect ward audits are only running around 50 or 60 percent at the moment. So there's a, an awful lot of wards that are not completing the audits. Uh, that, that's worth noting. Um, and then when we went on to the, uh, if you would go to the second part of the uh, uh, IQAC report, which was on the second discussion that we've had um, in detail, we, we obviously maternity last month and this time patient first, um, the ADO, the ADN, several of the members of the team present uh, have 
a very broad, very discursive, very positive discussion, I think, uh, very upbeat, very impressed with the apparent morale and enthusiasm within the team. Um, of those bullet points that are listed there, I'd pick out three to bring to your attention particularly. One was that because we'd had this a little bit of concern about uh, missed fractures at uh, DMH, um, concern had been raised about uh, consistency across um, uh, the care group. And it was good to see that the development of joint governance structures and exchange of good practice uh, that was taking place there. Um, it, would, it was noticeable that the team um, were very complimentary about their engagement with executive members. And uh, they were very um, complimentary about the ease with which they could get access to executives and they could get answers and decisions at short order. And finally, um, the, the, it, I think it's quite important that the, uh, the, the care group is, is looking at modelling, reviewing its position uh, with respect to the new holistic indicators that are emerging that will probably replace the four hour weight indicator um, to see how we would compare if that position was in place at the moment. I'll leave it there, Chair, unless there's any questions. Oh, that's no, great. great. And thank you for the opportunity to do with maternity as well. Really helpful. Any questions, observations yeah. from Michael? Paul, um, obviously I was at that meeting and it, I, I, I would echo what Michael said, it was excellent. Um, the only thing at the end, he did ask the team what they really wished for. And um, I think because they're now operating as a joint team, they really wished for some improvements at UHND, of the building, the structure of A&E, because they said they get such a good feeling going into Darlington, which is really good. But they sort of missed that at UHND. So I think we should always bear that in mind that we must try and do what we can for them at UHND. OK, thanks, Jenny. Yeah. If there's nothing else to do with integrated quality, we shall move on to Jeremy, medical. I'll switch off. Yeah, switch off. Just, about, yeah. just give me two seconds because I've got to get the speaker down as well. Excellent. Right. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I've got um, two items to discuss. First is workforce, uh, and then the second is mortality. I'll obviously we can have a gap in between so questions can be answered. Um, thought it was appropriate just to give uh, a more detailed update on what we've done with regards to workforce uh, with a couple of examples. Um, uh, I was reflecting it's four years since I started as medical director so there's been a lot of water under the bridge and a lot of change with regards to recruitment. Um, my overriding impression of this is that uh, it's been very much a collaboration across all the executive to get where we are which is in a much more positive uh, situation than we have been um, uh, four years ago. So um, if we just uh, I suppose really start with the, the two examples. The first would be the advert uh, that we put out last summer um, to increase our number of consultants by 19 in the medical specialties. You'll see in uh, uh, Appendix 1, the um, actually no, sorry, in Appendix 2, the, uh, the advert that went out mm -hmm. uh, and the positive effect that had. Um, I know, for example, that uh, it was up in the uh, various coffee rooms in James Cook um, uh, for quite some time. So we did recruit quite heavily on the back of that. Uh, and again, very positive. Uh, the, the next is uh, rheumatology. Um, we had 5.2 consultants in 2016. Uh, essentially by 20, uh, mid 2018, we were down to two. And then uh, the following year, we were down to one consult substantive consultant. Um, through working with the ops team and uh, pharmacy and physiotherapy, we changed the model that we were using for physiotherapy uh, for rheumatology. Uh, so that now uh, you have uh, the rheumatology, sorry, the physiotherapist seeing all the patients before they get to the consultant. The consultant seeing 
um, and diagnosing the patients that the physio can't deal with, and then handing them over to a combination of pharmacy and nurse specialists to manage their long-term conditions, and then only seeing the problems, uh, the patients with problems. Um, because the uh, consultants were having to review and prescribe thousands of patients with uh, on drug um, uh, on what's called DMARDs, which is essentially immunotherapy. Uh, um, by doing changing this model around, we are now back up to 5.5 consultants, and um, we are taking back the patients that we had lost to uh, other. Uh, providers in the region. So, um, and our last recruitment, uh, the candidate was interviewed by or interviewed uh, with us and with Northumbria and chose to take uh, our job offer as opposed to Northumbria, which I think is massively uh, uh, sim uh, a massive symbol of, uh, of the uh, improvements. So, in terms of how we've done it, I again I'd highlight the the um, the way we're working between the uh, different exec teams, so workforce, um, the the speed of which the uh, recruitment goes ahead is is a lot faster than it was uh, five years ago, four or five years ago, which means that it's much uh, more seamless. Um, finance, um, the you know the business case that we had last summer uh, to appoint. Uh, all these extra consultants would only have uh, happened with the, the help of finance. Um, uh, changing the way we uh, provide healthcare, again making the uh, the jobs more attractive, uh, is down to you know working with the uh, operational departments and nursing departments, um, uh, so that we can mix models. Uh, so it's you move away from it being purely consultant delivered. Um, so, in terms of total full-time equivalents, um, we are in a much stronger place. Uh, so that's on page one to seven. You can see that that is um, we've recruited a lot more than we've lost, uh, which is uh, very, very uh, impressive. I I'd just then like to point out certain things that we've done internally um, in terms of the medical director's team. When I started, we were running on average, well, there were some job plans that were 15 to 16 PAs, um, which is in my book actually not possible. Um, there aren't that many hours in the week. Uh, so we now in this coming job planning round, uh, the maximum, unless you're in a leadership position, will be 12.5 PAs, which improves uh, people's work-life balance massively. Um, the use of teams um, and this kind of uh, virtual communication has made a big difference to our ability to communicate um, both to the clinical leadership and also to the rest of the consultant workforce, um, which has made engagement um, so much easier um, because people can have this sort of communication uh, at home. Uh, because of the pandemic, we've made all SBA or sporting professional activity work uh, possible to be done at home rather than mandating it to be in the workplace. Um, again, that's made a, uh, a real improvement in the engagement of the, the workforce. The rest facilities, um, I will continue to thank the uh, uh, PFI pro providers and estates for allowing us to put the comfy chairs in the uh, canteens. Uh, any of you, when you uh, get the opportunity of coming into the trust, uh, want to see um, multidisciplinary uh, working, uh, just need to go into the canteens and look at the different staff groups that are availing themselves of those rest facilities. Um, and then finally, as was discussed, realistic establishments. What is it actually that we need to do to provide the healthcare that we're aspiring to have? And again, that goes with having uh, appropriate business cases and expansion, especially in the medical uh, specialties. So acute medicine, A&E, 
um, uh, and uh, cardiology, respiratory, endocrinology and gastroenterology. So uh, a positive story that I thought you should be aware of. The, the, so what's next? Well, I think obviously we've got to reflect on what we've done well, where we have further areas and focus of uh, concern um, and certain specialties such as uh, histopathology uh, do need to have some focus work to improve things. And an area where we've not had success is in the CESA route to consultant. Um, so there's a traditional route where you go and do higher, higher training. Um, so you do foundation training, uh, core training, then higher training, and then uh, you get onto the specialist register. The alternative route is called CESA, it's um, which is where an individual creates a portfolio and then sends it in to the GMC for them to assess whether or not you are on the specialist register. We have had some people who've gone down that route it is incredibly onerous, um, but we've also appointed various uh, locum consultants with a view to CESA. By the nature of the fact that those, pay, uh, those staff are going to high pressure specialties because we haven't been able to recruit, hence we're doing this alternative route, they tend to concentrate on clinical work and don't spend the time, even though we put it in the job plans, uh, doing the CESA so we are not as far advanced with that as I would like, and that's the, the next thing to look at. So uh, any questions with regards to the workforce paper? Thank you, Jeremy. That's a great positive story. Any questions, observations? One from me, Paul, please. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Yeah, I, I, it's a really encouraging picture. I was just wondering, um, what you would see as potentially the impact of the ICS, its workforce plans and collaboration between trusts and all this sort of thing on, on the recruitment of, of medical staff moving forward, Jeremy? So uh, it's, it's a question I'm asked uh, by every potential candidate, uh, shortly or prefaced by is the trust splitting up? Uh, and that is a question that's asked, you know, what, what about the ICS, what about the ICPs? And to the, what I say to them, and I'll say to you, to the rank and file consultant, it makes no difference. We will continue to collaborate and um, uh, work with partners as appropriate, and we'll continue to do so uh, no matter what the changes are with regards to um, ICS, ICPs, or whatever it is. Collaboration on a pathway basis is absolutely the way forward. Um, the fact that we're all now on block contracts as opposed to peer, uh, PBR means that we have to uh, quality improve our way out of problems and also work with other providers uh, in a non-financial way to improve pathways. And as I say, for the most of the um, medical staff, it will make no difference what the uh, regional situation is. And it's certainly not hampering our ability to recruit. Good. Thank you. OK, <clears throat> if there's nothing else, Jeremy, we shall move on to mortality. Thank you. <clears throat> so mortality. A um, lot of things going on. I, in the simplest terms, our big areas of concern are our shimmy, uh, which is, as you know, we're an outlier. And that is demonstrated in the uh, in the papers. Um, we are doing a number of things to mitigate that. Uh, as you know, we have a coding uh, review group, and there are a number of things written down uh, there as to what that uh, what that group has come up with to try and help with changing our coding. Because although we've improved, so have everyone else, and we remain the uh, worst in inverted commas coders uh, in the region it's uh, it remains the fact that the the best coder in the region which is north tees also has the best mortality in terms of shimmy um, uh, interestingly the second best is gateshead which doesn't have uh, the second best uh, mortality and is 
uh, although in uh, the, the tram lines um, is not doing quite as well. Um, so coding is very important. I, I just point you to um, section B of the appendix, um, which we are now looking at every single uh, patient from a mortality review point of view who has a mortality of less than 20 percent. We've gone from 10 to 20 percent. Uh, just as we also looked at all the patients who uh, died with acute bronchitis. And the picture you'll see from the pie charts is that there hasn't been any want of care in those reviews. The, the care has been rated uh, as good for the vast majority. Um, to add into the triangulation, we also looked at a handful, and we'll be looking at more of these, but this is just a start for 10, of a random selection, and it was genuinely random selection of uh, patients and just recoded them. And that's those 10 patients that you can see there. And of those 10, nine of them had severe life limiting illnesses, um, but were coded as having mortality risks as less than 10%. So that is, I, I think, one of our major, if we get that right, then our mortality will, uh, uh, figures will drop. Um, ultimately, with regards to coding, the solution is EPR, because once you've put a, um, a code in, it will always repopulate. And so our uh, we won't have the problem of having to re-upload it every single time. So there is a solution. We need to mitigate for the next year, um, but there will be a solution when EPR is brought in. Um, the AKI nurses have started. Uh, as you know, they started last September. The data which you can see from the CRAB data, which I'll come on to in a bit, is... Um, promising, but it was one month's data. Um, I know we've got further data which has been completely skewed by COVID and frankly I don't think any of us can make it out. Uh, so uh, as I've said before, I think it's going to take a whole year for us to really work out the impact of the AKI on nurses. Um, one of the concerns that you'll see from the mortality review, uh, the re mortality reviews, uh, and as ever, there's a lot more positive than they are negative, is the escalation and communication of DNA CPR. This has been a national issue. It's been in the national press, and we have not been immune to that. Uh, we've had some concerns raised from the safeguarding, adult safeguarding team that people were inappropriately put on DNA CPRs, and another uh, couple of concerns uh, coming in from GPs. Where those concerns have been raised, we've gone back and checked. There has not been any issue with the appropriateness of those people having a DNA CPR. The issue has been with regards to communication and actually due to handoffs. So because our speed of uh, flow through the A&Es and AMUs is so much greater, the AMUs aren't having the time to have the appropriate discussion with the families and the patients and are expecting the um, back of house to have those conversations. However, the back of house have thought that the front of house have had those conversations. So what's then happening is that it's falling between the cracks, that very appropriate discussion. Again, EPR will solve this by putting hard stops in there you have to have had that communication and sign it off before the DNA CPR is signed off. Um, but again, we've got uh, a series of suggestions that will solve, well, mitigate that problem until EPR starts. Um, so that's it with regards to that. And then finally, CRAB data, uh, just to say that the surgical mortality and morbidity is as it should be. There was a major blip with regards to fractured neck ephema in April last year. Uh, this was uh, due to fractured neck ephema, uh, due to COVID. Uh, and if a patient had a active COVID infection and had a fractured neck ephema, their mortality went from 6% to 60%. Uh, 
Uh, this has been replicated across the whole country. Um, and with greater testing and knowledge, patients with COVID and fractured neck ephemera are being treated conservatively whilst they have an active COVID infection. Uh, you'll also see in the medical <coughs> part of the CRAB data that we have issues with AKI, um, and that's leading to multiple trigger issues, but that again is being mitigated, we hope, by the AKI nurses. So that's the highlights from a mortality point of view. Again, any questions? Michael? Uh, you're on mute, are you? Michael? You were back on. Okay. Well. <laughs> I'm here now, Jeremy. Um, <laughs> thanks, Chair. Um, I, I take really good assurance from this suite of reports, actually. Um, very encouraged by progress uh, with the coding investigations, if you like, the research that you've been doing uh, into, if you like, weaknesses or structural weaknesses within our coding. Very encouraged by the fact that CRAB actually confirms a lot of the theses that uh, Jeremy's been putting forward for, with respect to AKI, for example. And the question really is, given the fact that we've been an outlier on shimmy for such a long time and that we've got now as you're saying there, Jeremy, a year to try and mitigate it before EPR hopefully provides a solution. Are there any external ramifications about us remaining an outlier for so long, whether regulatory or inspection-wise? Um, so we discussed this uh, whenever CQC, yeah, and I don't, uh, Sue's shaking her head, uh, they don't seem they seem to be accepting our explanations and our mitigations. Uh, so I th I don't see it as a problem in the immediate um, uh, immediate future. No, I mean, Warren, would you? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think not yesterday, but February, I think, is going to be the thing. Yeah, I mean, we just improve um, our understanding and analysis of the issue. And, um, and I, you know, the fact that we've done, we've now triangulated through externally with Nikos um, and Tony Roberts, internally with mortality reviews and internally with separate coding, uh, I, I think that's frankly as good as it gets. We we recognise we have a problem with AKI. We have the solution in place. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I, I think they are comfortable. Sue's got her hand up as well. Sue, I, I so before I, started, I didn't catch what Warren said, so you might want to. So, so Warren was saying essentially that uh, we discussed it with the CQC at their Tuesday, uh, their, Tuesday their February uh, review, and they weren't concerned at that point. Okay, thanks. Sue? Ask on page 210. Uh, yes. And it doesn't really talk about them, so it rings them, it, it does mention them, but um, for the, what it asks us to do, this is it's probably worth looking into, which I've maybe done for fracture neck and femur, is it worth looking into some of that, because that's two peaks in, in an area where it's pretty much above the line all the way, I mean it does dip a little bit below it. Well yes, but it's, so if you can see, it's one point, anything below 1.2 is in yeah. the, in the, and yes, it's peaked, but it's, again, I spoke to Mark from CRAB. So the peak in COVID, uh, first wave, which corresponds. But that's before COVID. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, I'm just thinking maybe it's worth having a look at, given that they talk about it in the text, because it does mention it, and it's okay. yeah. the laparotomy. Yeah, no, fair enough. I think that would be helpful. We okay. obviously do uh, contribute to the Mueller data as well, yeah. so that's excellent insurance as well. But yes, fair enough. Well, 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 sorry, I'm just missing some of the communication between Sue and so, Jeremy. Yeah, but, uh, so Sue is... I got, I got the gist of it. Okay. Yeah. Jenny? Uh, it's just really a practical thing because we've been paying, the charity has paid for the original coding project. Yeah. Um, will that be sufficient for what you need jeremy are you going to have to extend it and how are you going to fund it uh no i think that will be sufficient 
uh, to mitigate between now and EPR being in place uh, and put building blocks in place. So no, I don't anticipate us uh, extending that. Right. OK, thanks. OK. Any other question for Jeremy on mortality? Michael? Michael. Just, just one, it's just a, of uh, detail, really, Jeremy. On page 185 of the pack, which is the 2021 Learning from Deaths dashboard, um, I'm just I'm doing the uh, non-exec lead for mortality bit here, but um, I know that there's uh, a priority review for family health way back in quarter one that hasn't been completed. And if, if you go back to the previous year, there were also priority reviews, I think, in family health that were not completed. Is there any particular reason for that? Not that I'm aware, um, but I will. Uh, Uh, I will find out and I will get back to you next uh, next time if that's all right. Yeah, thank you. And I thought, by the way, that the progress in the dashboard of completion of priority reviews is excellent. It's just mm -hmm. that the family health ones just stick out. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, yeah. Thank you. Sue, were you wanted to come in again? It's, it's a legacy hand for Mrs. Jakes. It's a legacy, okay. Jenny, you legacy hand as well? Yeah, yeah. Go. Okay. On that basis, then we'll move on to the next item patient safety. Noel? I'm going to, I'll go on mute and. There you go. Okay. Thank uh, you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, you've got quite an extensive paper in your report together with a large number of appendices in response. Like questions, you can see, and we've already had some explanation of the reduction in COVID-19 in patients uh, and the effect that it has had. There's some commentary around hospital onset COVID-19 cases, which have been extensively reviewed, and I'm certain we'll be talking about for years to come. Um, there's also other references to other healthcare associated infection works, such as a review of an increased incidence of aspergillus, which is a very serious fungal uh, infection, particularly of concern to immunocompromised patients uh, um, and those that are vulnerable, such as in intensive care units or chemotherapy departments, um, which uh, that review has been complete and shows no uh, significant concerns. However, you'll see further down that aspergillus is a concern at Shotley Bridge chemotherapy unit, as is Pseudomonas, uh, which is a bacterial infection associated with static water. Um, and the environment there failed audits on both of those counts recently and is in need of some remediation. Um, nevertheless, uh, the patient experience is dramatically improved. I've been to both chemotherapy units in the last seven days um, and the nursing staff comment um, how well the transition has gone from the acute sites to Bishop Auckland and Shotley Bridge, with the exception of the induction chemotherapy work, which is continuing um, in Durham for those patients who may require medical assistance at their first dose of treatment. The National Patient Safety Strategy is appended. You'll see a slight reduction in the number of complaints, interestingly. Uh, Sue's taken a keen interest in the quality of complaints response, and as a result, We've changed the structure of the template to make it more accessible to complainants. Mm. Apology where we've made a weakness. Um, we now, uh, as of this morning, have 57 cases of Clostridium difficile, which is clearly quite a worrying trend. Uh, we've spent so long worrying about COVID-19 that perhaps We've taken our foot off the gas in relation to other healthcare associated infections, and that will be a key part of our infection control program in the forthcoming financial year. The root cause analysis of the second case of MRSA bacteremia uh, concluded two weeks ago, and I have to say the clinicians involved were very open and honest about the weaknesses uh, in a case which was, in hindsight, a clearly utterly avoidable a bacteremia case in an extremely frail patient with multiple comorbidities. 
There are some new serious incidents to report to you, uh, a fall, unavoidable pressure damage, uh, a missed cancer, uh, two cases of bowel obstruction where the management was uh, suboptimal. The never event retention of foreign body root cause analysis has been delayed because one of the key players has been ill, but that's taking place this week. And there's also some commentary on a delay in treatment for a subdural hemorrhage, which may have affected the outcome for the patients. On pages 27, you can see a fuller explanation of the missed fracture review in the emergency department. Um, as has already been mentioned, stronger evidence, collaborative working, peer review, multidisciplinary teamwork and adherence to tools that have been shared by the Royal Colleges, which hopefully will improve the differential diagnosis in, in, in what is sometimes subtle changes to x-rays. Um, the numerous uh, appendices give you an indication of the approach we've taken to uh, uh, C. diff. I think it is interesting to note that we have in benchmarking terms the second lowest rates in the region but the lowest number of side rooms. Clearly that proportion may change with the bringing on of new wards such as Ward 7 in Bishop Auckland which is encouraging. There is um, some reference to the previous NEB event uh, and the remedial action plan. Um, you asked me to comment upon the nursing structure, that is to say the corporate nursing approach to monitoring compliance with the Mental Health Act. We have for many years had issues with the compliance with Section 132 papers, that is to say the serving of patients with their rights when they've been detained under the Mental Health Act. Um, we do have an SLA with Tees, Esk and Weir Valleys. Um, I'm pleased to say that I've finally come around to Jenny's point of view that we should assimilate the Deprivation of Liberty Safeguards Mental Capacity Bill team with the Mental Health Act compliance team. Um, and I'm pleased to report that we've secured some additional funding um, through my executive colleagues to make that happen. That will not be the end of the story. The mental capacity bill is, be, is due to be replaced and a consultation on the code of practice for the liberty protection safeguards which will replace the mental capacity bill is slated for the first half of the next financial year and that may mean that we require further resources because we will in effect become a quasi legal authority of ourselves as opposed to referring Dolls applications to the local authority, which uh, they've persistently been unable to respond to. Um, for completeness, you've got the board assurance reports regarding maternity staffing um, and the gap analysis that was submitted as part of the Ockenden report response. So um, I'm sorry you've got a mere, I think, 52 pages. Um, but uh, I've tried to make them as pictorial and accessible as I can, um, and I'm sure you found them riveting reading. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, uh, Jenny. Just to say thank you. I think now the mental health team seems um, uh, complete, really. And looking at the Mental Health Act is, Act is being reviewed, and there's consultation out about that. And just thinking about our IQAC discussion last week about the the effect of mental health patients on our A and E, and even in the family uh, care group where they were saying how much that you have, how many more um, young people they're seeing with mental health problems. I just think it makes sense, and I think that's just going to become more and more important as we go forward. And it's almost as if you need a joint team in both A and E's just to cope with what you're dealing with with mental health so I do welcome it and thank you I have actually put yay by <laughs> the yeah, bit of report thank you yeah uh, uh, Peter's making careful why a why uh, Peter um, <laughs> I, I would want to draw a distinction between compliance with our legal responsibilities and having sufficient capacity to meet additional yeah. demand yeah. And the point that you make around the effect of lockdown on society, young people in particular, um, individuals who may have a predilection to eating disorders or self-harm, 
I think is one of the biggest risks we face in the next 12 months. Yeah. A six-fold increase in eating disorder referral to paediatric dietetics. Um, an unyet, as yet unclear increase in self-harming adolescents uh, and children with other emotional disturbances in our paediatric wards. Um, I'm, when I do rounds, I'm shocked to find that they now outnumber the number of children with what I would call bread and butter respiratory infections. And, uh, and, and clearly this place is paediatric general trained nursing staff in particular, but physicians also in a very difficult position. We are grateful for the support of our chief colleagues. We do have a very good mental health liaison team in the emergency departments that respond routinely within one hour. But I think the loss of 52 child and adolescent psychiatry beds in November 2019, with no attempt to replace them in the foreseeable future, only by phases 10 more beds coming on stream of a general uh, child and adolescent nature um, in 21-22, in I think we'll, we'll further um, put pressure on, on the front line. And we have a perfect storm, increasing demand, diminishing provi uh, um, provision, um, and at the same time, uh, the further demands of compliance with new legislation, which we have struggled to manage in the past. So it's a big issue for us. I'm very, very grateful to the executive for supporting me uh, in expanding capacity in the compliance sphere. Uh, but in the area of provision, I think there's uh, rather more work to do. Uh, I do get very good support. We have very good relationships with Chuv. Uh, but if I'm honest, uh, many of their issues are also around workforce supply uh, and securing enough great people to, to help manage these very difficult children and adults um, has been a persistent problem nationally. Okay. Um, and uh, I don't even want to go into uh, some of the regulatory issues, which I'm certain are being picked up. But I have not really had any discussions with commissioners on, the, on any of those aspects. Thank you, Noel. Thank you. Michael. Thanks, Chair. It's just with uh, respect to complaints closed with extensions. Um, Malcolm reported at IQAC that there'd been a a 50% jump in the number of complaints closed with extensions in January. And I think he's going to look into the reasons for that. I wondered if he'd managed to dig something up. And the other question was very, very simple one. Um, could you explain what the traffic light system with respect to water jugs is uh, for ah. the initiative on improving <laughs> fluid balance? Okay, okay. so um, I'll, do, I'll do the simple one first. Um, so traffic lights with water jugs. Um, we want patients to drink plenty in order to hydrate their kidneys. Yeah. Um, if we have different colour tops to the water jugs, red means you've had your first litre of water, amber, your second litre of water, green, your third litre of water. So it's a means of encouraging patients to drink more with uh, visual reinforcement and an encouragement to staff to help patients drink plenty, but clearly not too much in those patients that are fluid restricted. Um, that was... What was the first? What was the first question again? Sorry. It, it was the the fact that we'd had a fifty percent rise ah, in the number yeah. of complaints closed with extensions in January. Yeah, I th I think it's a combination of factors. Um, clearly, the redeployment of staff into the front line um, means that individuals may not be necessarily familiar, perhaps may not be uh, uh, as easily able to communicate any queries uh, and resolve misunderstandings uh, at ward level. Uh, redeployments have now. Uh, ceased. Almost all staff are back to their day job as of 22nd March. The only exception to that being uh, a few staff in the intensive care units where complaints are relatively rare, I would say. So I'm hopeful that that is being responded to. I'm dealing with requests for complaint extensions and a more stringent approach to monitoring of complaints timescales um, almost on an hourly basis. I've dealt with three this morning during this meeting. Um, so I'm quite certain that that is being addressed and where we are letting down complainants in relation to an agreed time frame to respond, we are communicating with them directly. And very often it's because the complaint is complex, may involve more, more than one department and in some cases more than one agency. Uh, and clearly if when we pull the complaints response together, so there was one, for example, this warning that was a request for a third extension, the composite complaint response 
was contradictory. Departments didn't agree between themselves as to what had happened and why we had we'd, um, let that patient or their family down. So all of this makes um, responding in a timely fashion slightly more difficult, but I'm confident we are making progress. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. It's just a thought, Noel. Obviously, you've made reference to T's Eskimo Valley and they have their own problems in recruiting staff. Indeed. But I just wonder, would there be an opportunity to try and recruit in our trust dual qualified staff? We are a rare breed, as you know, but uh, those that are general trained and mental health trained, particularly around our A&E departments. Yes, I'm, I haven't I had that conversation to see if you're available, Paul. Um, but uh, as, as you say, we do visit it occasionally. Um, some of the issues in relation to our current dual qualified staff, by that I mean paediatric and adult trained staff, mm -hmm. is maintaining their competence and yeah. having sufficient demand of work. It's either feast or famine. Right. Um, and I would imagine we'd have a similar issue in, in mental health. Mm -hmm. I think there is, however, room to have that discussion in paediatrics, which we've never had before. Right. Um, so uh, I think we will look at all of those opportunities. I think the right. broader issue is around the competence and capacity of our general nurses mm. and doctors um, and our paediatric nurses and doctors in particular um, okay. and availing of the outreach teams that do support individuals in the community through in the in, in the CAMS and mental health liaison service and see how if they can share some of the tools and techniques in managing some of the those rather troubled uh, young people. Um, okay. and, and that's one area that I'm, I'm very keen to look at. Thanks, Noel. In terms of the NHS Patient Safety Strategy 2021 update, it's quite a comprehensive document and obviously it needs some working through in terms of the standards and requirements and so forth. So who will be the person that will take the lead on that? Because it's a huge task. Um, it, it is a huge task. Um, included within it is uh, a requirement to appoint a patient safety specialist, and that is the person of Lisa Ward. You'll be aware that Joanne Todd retires today. Uh, Lisa Ward takes up her position. You'll see from the restructure that Lisa's responsibilities are slightly different to Joanne's. She will be the patient safety specialist and the chief nursing information officer, which is part of the EPR business case. So we'll assume that that piece of work, which will require further training um, mm. and, and a broader approach to the networking. The emphasis are around forensic investigation as opposed to collaborative peer review and root cause analysis is quite an interesting one. Mm. Um, but it, on account of, the, of those changes, the responsibilities of the rest of the team will also change. Uh, and you'll see that um, the tissue viability back care service and moving handling service, Carol Johnson will lead with some enhanced responsibility and Tom Jakes will take exclusive responsibility for infection prevention and control uh, and has been promoted to an associate director of nursing. Oh, that's that's great. And that that part doesn't because I was going to ask on the nursing structure where Tom Jokes actually fits in in terms of lines of responsibility, but you've you've just answered that. But yeah, just on that structure on page three, four, three, Lisa Ward appears in two places. So has that structure got to be updated or is this it? That 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 is accurate. If I've if I've confused you with the presentation, that's because um her responsibilities are are broad and she may need to have appeared in more than one graphic. But uh, right. that, that is correct. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Noel. Any other question for Noel on of the multiple papers we've received from him? No, on that basis then, thank you, Noel, and we'll move on to Carol Integrated Performance. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can do now, Carol, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, so as usual, I will cover the first part of the integrated quality and performance report, and then pass on to my colleagues accordingly. Um, so, I feel as though there has probably been a few, um, a fair few trailers to the content of this in the meeting already. 
Um, so um, uh, um, hopefully no surprises um, in here. Um, I, um, in relation to the constitutional targets and activity and performance, um, my summary of what uh, the position is, is that we continue to be in an improving position and we continue to compare very favourably with our regional colleagues. So if I can take you just very briefly and draw out a few um, areas in the report. So if I can take you to what is page four of the report that is called COVID-19 wave two slash three statistical update. And what you will see from those two pages that you've got there is um, a summary of what we've all been, um, been going through um, certainly over the last few months, but also stretching back over the course of the, the last year. And, uh, and a number of the points that colleagues have already made are there graphically illustrated for you so that you can see what the predictions were, what the actual experience was, and also what, um, what our activity looked like at various stages along the way, according to a number of measures, um, uh, including number of cases, number of admissions, both our deaths and also our discharges, and also an age distribution, um, which, um, which hopefully adds a little bit more flavour to, um, to the, the discussions that we've been having so far. If I can then take you over the page to the, um, the page that is marked Phase 3 Recovery Summary. And of course, what you'll remember from um, previous reports is that um, after we'd been through Wave 1, we, we were in that reset phase and we were required to, um, to plan, to, to, do, to do our demand and capacity planning and to submit uh, trajectories of what our performance would be to the end of the year. Um, and interestingly, as, um, as you will remember, um, at that stage when we were submitting these, uh, these trajectories, um, we, we were explicitly um, instructed to, um, uh, to not plan on there being a wave two or even a wave three. Um, it just shows how times change, doesn't it? Um, nevertheless, what you have there is you have a series of graphs. The blue line um, is, um, is then what our actual performance has been. And the red line was our actual planning, uh, uh, planning submission. Um, with the green line being the target that we, um, um, when, when, when we were given, when we were required to submit our trajectories, um, I think we were, um, the green line probably represents what the right answer was. Um, and the red, uh, the red line was what we thought that we could reasonably um, uh, aim and have the ambition to do. And what you will see is that um, our recovery was, um, was, was trundling along really quite nicely up until um, November, December and the early part of this year. But what you will see, and I'm very pleased to report that during the last month, you will see that um, uh, our recovery that Sue mentioned earlier on in the meeting, um, uh, we've got a definite uptick there. Um, and indeed, what you will see is on quite a number of our planning trajectories that we submitted, we've already exceeded in terms of performance in relation to that. We did receive the long awaited um, operational planning guidance for, um, for this next year, mm. only last Thursday, I think it was. Um, and in that there are, um, as usual, there are a number of requirements set out for when we um, submit a, a refreshed version of these to cover particularly the first six months of next year. Um, but looking to in, within the context of the, the whole year. Um, and we are working on those at this particular point in time, which will pick up from, from these and, um, uh, and also take us um, into and link up with the business plan that we have for next year. So, so having set that context, then um, just pulling out the particular areas, um, and, um, and just very briefly um, drawing your attention to um, so the A&E performance again we've mentioned it earlier on in the, the meeting um, there was a, a headline mention in the 
um, in the uh, COVID report earlier on in the meeting. And what we had seen is we'd seen a gradual return to the, the levels of demand that we were seeing pre-COVID, um, which were putting pressures on the service in the context of still de um, dealing with the, um, the COVID response within the hospital. And so consequently, we'd seen our four hour performance uh, start to um, start to dip and we were running at around about at our lowest point, we were um, running at about 80 percent. If I can just then pick up on the point that Michael mentioned and IQAC and um, and the commitment and enthusiasm of the team. So um, even though people, I think, um, have have been um, particularly challenged in dealing with the um, the COVID response from from wave three. Um, nevertheless, the, the team have bounced back and um, and and have picked up the challenge again of all of those initiatives that um, I, I've certainly briefed you about over the years now um, that we know make a difference and um, and getting in and working with the staff particularly in the ED department and AMU about um, about then um, enabling patient flow and really um, uh, keep, keeping a tight grip on the management of, of patients as they flow, flow through the department. And, um, and so what we have seen is that during March, we've seen really some very positive results from that. Um, and um, and we, um, as, as I'm sitting here and speaking now, we're at about 90% for, um, for March in terms of performance, which is a good position for us to be in because actually that represents a much better patient experience um, as, they, uh, as, um, as our patients then flow through our hospital. What it also is a good um, a position to be in is um, we have long trailed with you and indeed it has already been mentioned um, once already in the meeting today about those new emergency care standards that will replace the four hour um, standard. Um, and to, to know that we are working in an efficient and an effective manner then provides us with a really good baseline for what is going to be a trial period for the beginning of this year and again was flagged up in the operational guidance of those new standards. Um, which include time to assessment and and um, and a few other areas. So um, um, so I'm I'm pleased with where we've got to because I know um, and uh, um, and I know I'd said in IQAC last month that I was disappointed in where in in um, what our performance in A and E um, had dropped back to. Um, I'm certainly much more comfortable now with where we are. And, um, and and where we um, and what it is that we can do and what is right for our patients as well. Um, so then just very briefly, if I can then um, move on to the elective program. So again, been mentioned earlier in the meeting. Um, we started our we started to step up our elective program to coincide with um, that context that I've already talked about. Once, once we saw the number of COVID cases starting to come down, we were then in a position to know and, and judge when we could start standing up our, um, our elective activity. And again, I would want to reinforce that we never stopped our um, urgent emergencies and cancer cases. Um, the, uh, the elective programme that we were standing up was then more to do with the less urgent and those people on our waiting list and particularly those people who had been waiting longer periods of time where their clinical condition meant that we needed to um, uh, expedite their, uh, their care. So we, we were able to um, step up the elective programme we had to judge that because whilst we weren't, were seeing reductions in the number of patients on the base wards, we didn't see a, as rapid a decline in the number of patients in our um, critical care beds. 
um, and um, and of course our critical care capacity was using staff from our theatres. So we had to judge it very carefully about how quickly we could step up that elective program. We have done that now, and as you will see, as you would have seen from that context that I showed you of the um, the recovery trajectories, what we are looking to do, and and in the ongoing planning, is um, to the to the best of our ability. Um, get ourselves up to our 1920 uh, level of activity um, as soon as it is practical and feasible to um, to do that. So what you're then seeing in terms of the constitutional standards um, is that you are seeing um, a, a gradual improvement, a slow step-by-step -step improvement in our RTT. You, were, you are seeing um, a continued um, eye water in the large number of people that are over 52 week weights. But our planning that we have done and are refining as part of that operational <coughs> guidance um, submission that we will need to do looks to us um, managing and as I reported last month at the board when we looked at this in a little bit more detail, um, we uh, are looking to get ourselves into position where there will be no over 52 week waits by this time next year. We will then use the year after uh, um, in order to be able to then improve on our overall RTT position. And as Sue has mentioned earlier, I'm part of a chief operating officers group across the region um, and uh, and that, uh, that puts us um, amongst the best in in the region. Um, there are um, a, a few trusts that will not be able to, that forecast that they will not be able to get to that position for some considerable period of time. Um, but all things being equal, that is what our planning is, um, is, is looking like. Um, I'll pause there because I can see that Paul, Paul Foster Jones has put his hand up. Paul. Okay. Oh, it's not a right. OK. <laughs> right. OK. Um, and then just just then briefly finishing off what what I have to say about this. Um, again, against the, the backdrop of um, uh, of what I've been saying about capacity, um, we have um, uh, I think that we've done a really good job actually within the trust in terms of our diagnostics. Um, we're, we're up at about 96 percent. Um, against a 99% target. When you consider where we were and the amount of backlog that we'd got and how that was then impacting particularly on cancer treatments, but also um, on the um, on the urgent elective pathways, um, we, we are in such a much, much better position. And again, I know from my discussions with my colleagues in other trusts, um, uh, how much There you go. I've said it. Um, and um, and then fin finally, as a result of that, what you are also seeing in the report is um, a gradual improvement and catching up on the um, the cancer constitutional standards. We're not back to where we were, but again, we are doing so much better. And I've said it again. That's twice now. Um, uh, then um, uh, then. Um, our peer group within the um, within the north. So um, so generally, um, ge generally, I, I think quite a positive position. But we are not complacent, and there is an awful lot of work to do. And um, and I'm I am very much aware that when we are doing this and when we are setting these um, uh, these trajectories for what we do next. All of that discussion that we have had earlier on in the meeting about um, staff health, well-being, tiredness really comes into play with all of this. Um, and I do feel really strongly that we, we, we do have to be very, very careful that we don't, um, that we don't come out of um, the, um, the wave of COVID and then straight into um, uh, trying to make people 
not just run a marathon, but run a marathon at a sprint speed, at a sprint speed. Um, and, uh, and, w and we just have to have um, a mind to that. Um, and, and I suppose my concern would be that whilst we as a board and an executive are very much aware of that, um, I, it, it does concern me in terms of um, um, operational planning guidance and other things that, uh, that may come down um, uh, from people and organisations that haven't necessarily been involved in um, as closely with that frontline COVID response. And on that note, um, before I, I before I say more than I ought to really, um, I'll I'll pause pause there, Paul, and take any um, uh, and take any questions before I hand over to um, Noel. Any questions for Carol? I don't see any hands, Carol. So thank oh, you for Paul, that. Paul, Paul Foster Jones has, um, oh, has waited. Oh, yes, he has. Yeah, Paul. Thank, thanks, Paul. Th thanks, Carol. Um, I mean, I think you know you you, you can pick in with specific KPIs in there, but the general picture, as you, as you outlined, is, is, is tremendous. And given where we were six or seven weeks ago to where we are now, I think the whole, the whole situation is to be commended and, 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 and almost congratulated for the, for the trajectory and the, and, the, and the rate of progress that's been made. But, but talking to your last point, I'm, I'm very conscious that you're walking a tightrope between reducing waiting lists and keeping staff in post and not burning them out. What, what sort of safeguard, practical safeguards are, and I know that it's an aspiration, but what sort of practical safeguards are you able to illustrate to us that, that those sorts of balances are being maintained? I, I think, Paul, I think it's the things that we've already talked about in the earlier part of the meeting, um, and the, um, uh, the, the trims work in particular, I think is particularly key um, key to that, um, but the whole raft of um, well-being um, initiatives that that we've put in place um, will all play their their part. And, and and for me, it's something about being aware of it, being vigilant to it, and also being responsive to it at all levels in the organisation. Um, is is almost the, the first but the biggest step in then just being realistic um, and um, and for us when we are putting those planning trajectories in and for stepping um, the work up there is that realism and that reality check and I can give you a real example um, as, as an executive through the gold command structure we had um, planned um, we, we've been looking at how at those graphs that you you've got now in in the report we were seeing how the COVID cases in our hospital were coming down we were tracking what was happening in terms of COVID in the community we were seeing that coming down and so we started to plan um, the step up of the elective program um, and um, and and we, we planned to introduce um, X number of theatre lists over a period of time. And actually what happened was that um, it, it was actually our clinical director for critical care who, um, uh, because of that responsiveness, but also because of that accessibility that we've also talked about in the meeting today, okay. um, was able to um, in effect, put his hand up via, via the, um, um, a, um, an email to us as executives to say, hang on a minute, I'm really concerned about this. Um, and I'm concerned because of um, we are still seeing very, very poorly patients, not just in our hospital, but actually in the wider region. Mm -hmm. um, and we were net importers of poorly patients into critical care in order to help South Tees and other areas. Um, and as a result of then that further discussion that we had, and which was almost the reality check, what we decided to do was to just slow down a little bit. Yeah. And, and we only delayed, I think it was um, in total for probably about two weeks really. Um, but we just slowed it down and did a more gradual step up 
than the biggest steps that we were going to take. Um, and that was that wasn't just about um, uh, physical capacity and mechanics and logistics. That was also about making sure that our staff were in the right places and also that, that we, we weren't sort of hustling people. Um, and, you know, one day you're in ICU and the next you're back in theatre and the next you're back on a ward and, and just to allow it to be a little bit more gradual. So just a practical example, Paul. And, and Mormon also wants to speak. Yeah, it, it, it's just to say, so there's sort of the, the close to lived, lived examples for an individual area and specific responses. But just to reassure that we have had a plethora of conversations and recording processes to try and monitor and map the well-being of, of our staff throughout the, the process of, of COVID and the impact. So that goes into uh, redeployment checklists where they are assessed in terms of the areas they're going into, suitability, any concerns, any issues, any impact. In reverse, they are being repatriated back to their substantive roles. There are repatriation conversations as well to be recorded, which is the same sort of principles. And then in addition to all of this, we've obviously had extensive risk assessment conversations being undertaken with all staff. And furthermore, a wellbeing conversation, which you're recording in all of these are not just one-offs, they are as and when required and can be conducted as needed. So there was quite a wide range of more, more formal asks that have gone through two line managers and we are sort of seeking continue to have assurance and some governance around that and that will continue and you mentioned earlier we've got being applied now to our this is very much an ongoing new new world in which which we live and work at I I I'm sorry Morgan I can't hear you because you know I'm right next to Carol so I don't know what more I can do sorry did you hear any of that? Yes, I did, but it's, it's, we lost about the last quarter, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, most of that was just highlighting all the formal conversations that have been initiated and the support that we're giving, and also our continuing um, commitment to engaging with a, a positive and proactive health and wellbeing agenda as, as we reasonably can, given our resources. So it's, it was just to contextualise that this is a much, much wider and well covered arena and we're acutely aware of this need. OK, thank you, Marvin. Jenny, you have a question. Uh, it wasn't really a question. It was just a compliment um, because my husband's had two appointments at the hospital, one with audiology and one with um, ultrasound. And he got both appointments very, very quickly. I was really surprised. He got his ultrasound within three weeks, which was not urgent. And he got his audiology one within a week yeah. after inquiring about getting new hearing aids. He's now going next Monday, I think, or Tuesday, sorry, for a, an assessment about getting a bone scan for a hearing aid. So it's been really, really quick. The only thing I tried to get was an appointment with musculoskeletal and I was told they're not taking any referrals. Absolutely, yeah. The, you, two, two different, two different issues and two different services there. So, when um, the, your your first is a real life um, um, experience of the diagnostic position, the musculoskeletal yes. is a real life example of where our waiting list problems are, um, which is largely MSK and orthopedics. Yeah, it's so, okay. I, I expected it. <laughs> yeah. You. Okay, okay, thank you, Carol. So we move on to Noel. Yep, okay. Uh, uh, yes, you can. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah we can hear you, yes. Um, you. So you can see our overall staffing position um, is indicated there. Uh, there are a number of quite pressured hotspots. This is clearly the report for February before the redeployments took place. Um, Ward 6 um, at Bishop Auckland has had to reduce beds because of less than half staffing. 
uh, and we've had similar pressure points, although not quite as extreme in wards five and six in Durham, also wards 12 and 15, uh, and to a lesser extent at Weirdale, where cross cover arrangements have mitigated those risks. Uh, but nevertheless, that is in the context of 314 RN vacancies, which is quite an extreme position before we take account of the new budgets, which David will be announcing in the next couple of weeks, which may make that appear somewhat worse. Um, 86 healthcare assistant vacancies. One should bear in mind that we're nevertheless aiming for a zero vacancies, and we have 120 um, shortlisted candidates for position. Um, and in large part, that's being supported by central funding for what's been called new to care uh, healthcare support workers. Um, and that includes um, education, orientation, and pastoral care. So um, we. program that's the clinical examination program for overseas nurses prior to registration um, is the best in the country I'm pleased to say and the whole of cohort one has now passed uh, and cohorts two and three are well on the way with uh, well over 70 percent pass rates so that's very encouraging um, you can see from the midwifery report that uh, we're showing a, an improving trend in terms of midwifery availability um, in the labor ward fill rate for temporary staffing um, is still below the confidence interval as it has been for the whole of last year. Um, that's in the context of the highest demand we've ever uh, experienced. Um, I am being uh, uh, pressed to release staff nurses to the mass vaccination centres and the primary care networks from the bank, which I am re resisting in the context that we're not filling our own gaps on our own wards. So that's just uh, uh, another pressure to um, consider. And I'm certain that um, some of the requests I've had to consider rates of pay will become more deafening um, as the weeks progress, given that context. Um, and with that, I'll hand back to Morvin to talk about some of the other HR numbers. Okay, can, right, okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah, thank you, Marvin. So, um, looking at the yeah, we, we're not we're not that slick yet at the hour hand over. That's a lot better, hopefully. So looking at the um, performance overview um, sheet that you have there, I'll just take you to the, the key metrics. And then as mentioned in the actions, you will see on the following page for a seven, there are those that are shown in the form of um, SPC charts as well. But voluntary turnover, it continues to be um, managed within our, our target and indeed has uh, dropped very slightly and the same with our, our total turnover so enti not entirely uh, surprising given the, the current landscape though um, with regards to absence we uh, are dropping um, but obviously there are different elements to our, our absence percentages so some impacted by COVID some impacted by um, specific reasons and we're picking up those COVID related ones versus our normal reasons for absence around MSK, but also substantially around the mental health coding. We have had support from um, a redeployed HR team since January, which was running until today in terms of helping the line management of uh, absentees, predominantly anybody due reporting a stress related reason for absence. So they were picked up at the earliest opportunity, i.e. day one. Uh, to ensure that they were being directed to appropriate resources and made sure that any appropriate help or support that was required could be given to try and effect the least absence that could, could be facilitated. And thereafter, any member of staff who then triggered a 28 day absence period, they have contacted and attempted to support them back to work in a, a positive and proactive way. 
we are expecting a report back on that uh, hopefully next week into to gold command and we'll take some some view on on what that impact might tell us about how, how we help support the absence management procedures going forward. So quite a bit of work being done on that, but um, the HR team do now need to return to uh, normal service along with other staff. So uh, we will have to review review that carefully. Then in addition, we have obviously the metrics are around core essential training and staff appraisal, which have not gone in the right direction, but again, not, uh, not surprisingly. We have also agreed to provide uh, a detailed overview of our compliance against core essential training and role specific training again due to come into goal next week which will start to highlight the areas that do need specific attention and the um, focus on us now reaching compliance back in those areas as quickly as possible now we have capacity to undertake some of that training in a more more timely manner so basically i think the metrics overall are not uh, at all bad given certainly what it is we've been working against and it feels as if we have good plans in place to help continue to manage and improve some of those so happy to take any questions on anything there any questions from Orvin mm, don't see any more of them so thank you okay thank you okay David Paul did Paul had his hand up No, shall I continue? Maybe not. David, yes. Okay, just to add briefly summarise the financial position for the 11 months of the financial year. Um, obviously, quick recap, the first six months of the year, we basically operated under a, a regime where we, in essence, reclaimed what we spent. For the second six months of the year, we were obviously allocated a financial um, envelope to live within. That included a COVID envelope, uh, an assumption around what we would be doing on testing and vaccination at the point in time we submitted the plan last October. Um, as Carol's already mentioned, that plan didn't include any second or subsequent COVID waves or spikes. So what you'll see as we look at the results for months 11, you'll see that we have spent slightly more than what we planned in terms of our costs although that has also been um, covered by additional income. The main thing within that position is we've done more testing than we originally expected. And obviously we recover that testing income um, to match the expenditure we incur. Um, a couple of other things just to note that hasn't dropped onto the pack as such. We are now reporting that we're forecasting a surplus position We've shown a surplus of 1.2 million at months 11, and we're forecasting we will retain that level as we go to year end. That surplus, in essence, is being generated by a, a windfall gain that we've had in terms of how the public dividend capital payment is going to be calculated this year. Um, it was confirmed um, during uh, February that the cash benefit we've received by receiving our cash payments a month early all year um, the average cash balances would not be adjusted to take account of that factor and that therefore led to a windfall benefit from what we'd been um, previously assuming based on the information we've been provided with. So that's uh, the driver of the benefit that we've played into the bottom line currently at this point in time. A couple of other things just to note for information. The capital programme is obviously on track. We're currently forecasting that we will deliver um, our outturn position of 32.9 million, as we've been indicating to NHS EI. And, and in the interest of time, unless there's any queries, I'll, I'll stop there because obviously we'll be picking capital up later this afternoon in more detail. OK, thank you, David. Any question for David at this stage? Mm, no, thank you, David. Then if we move back to you, Morvan, there's the letter to HR directors. Yeah, OK, so 
um, hopefully can cover this one off quite briefly. So there are a number of letters that span nearly two years now, uh, initiated by the Dido Harding Review of um, the very unfortunate case of a suicide during suspension. And we took to IQAC in February on the 16th our full review of the actions and the status of them undertaken and completed and that was signed off at that time. That submission also included the re reference to the letter around the Imperial College disciplinary procedure which again we reviewed against our own revised disciplinary procedure and confirmed to IQAC that we had met and indeed some instances we felt had um, improved on some of the, the points within that procedure. So it was not felt relevant to do anything further. So we had already undertaken a review of that process following the, the Dido Harding review anyway. So the full action plan, et cetera, was included into IQAC in February, but obviously we only had a private board. So the, the overview was submitted, but the detail is included in IQAC. So that is all completed now and covered off. However, I would obviously say that we will continue to review from a, a continuous review process anything that we can improve on as, as, and, as and when we go. So uh, clearly it's not a, an end to it. We'd like to think we are always keeping up, if not ahead of what we should be doing. So That's hopefully great. that uh, provides assurance around that point. Absolutely, yes. Any observations or questions for Morvan? No, thank you, Morvan. And uh, finally, Warren, the Trust Board subcommittee structure. OK, thanks, Paul. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so this um, obviously follows on from the discussions that uh, we've had in committees and as a, a NED group and previously at board in terms of future direction of travel. Um, we've previously agreed that the rationale for finance committee as it was in terms of supporting financial recovery has gone uh, and that we want to move uh, IQAC in the direction of seeking assurance not only over quality as is but in terms of quality strategy and continuous quality improvement. Um, I think it's fair to say that IQAC has, has trialled that approach in terms of um, the maternity discussions and the patient first discussions and that's gone well. Um, we have had the opportunity to look at what this means at IQAC previously and what it would mean for terms of reference. That did throw up some uh, key uh, questions for people really in terms of how we make sure that we keep the link between workforce and quality, a lot of which is built into um, the CDDFT Quality Insights tool, but we would need to keep under review whether um, that link is strong enough and IQAC is retaining enough information and also how uh, we would keep enough of a link in terms of looking at um, how we manage access uh, from a performance point of view in particular and whether that has um, patient experience implications in particular that IQAC would want to understand. And we did agree mitigations for those uh, as well as a macro level mitigation that, that Paul Foster Jones has offered to uh, attend IQAC for a transitional period as well to make sure both uh, of the committees knit together very well. So um, from an IQAC point of view, the terms of reference should reflect the discussions that we've had uh, and the way of working should also reflect the discussions we've had. Uh, the proposal for finance committee is to move it more in the direction of um, continuing to provide assurance, seek assurance, I should say, uh, uh, over financial performance and delivery of the financial plan, but stretching that out to essentially all objectives in the operational plan, including operational performance, workforce, uh, etc., um, and supporting the the general non-executive holding to account role with the execs. We haven't had the opportunity, clearly, with finance committee running as it has. Um, to have um, had a look at potential terms of reference until now. Uh, but with that introduction in mind, essentially what you have is uh, the terms of reference that build on the IQAC discussion, uh, hopefully accurately reflects it, and some initial proposed terms of reference for the board's review um, for what I'm calling Operational Performance and Assurance Committee, or OPAC, everything ends in AC, um, uh, going forwards. Um, 
and so I'm happy to stop there, take any comments or suggestions, um, but would like to get to a position where um, we can um, refine what we've got here uh, and have a plan to, um, to, to move to the new ways of working. That's great, Warren. Well, many thanks for pulling that together. Does anybody have any questions around the terms of reference for both of these committees? Got Michael? Um, not questions, actually. Thank, uh, just thanks to Warren, because the the, um, the work does reflect the conversations we've had. And I'll confirm mm. that um, uh, myself and Paul Foster-Jones have had lengthy conversations about how the committees will work, including right up until yesterday. There are just a couple of minor tweaks that I'd request, if possible. Um, mm. The first one would be, um, well, there's a reference in the IQAC terms of reference to them receiving the minutes from EPSEC and CEC, and actually they don't they receive uh, escalation reports or summary reports yeah. rather than the minutes. I wondered if um, the paragraph 3.4 of the terms of reference for the new committee should apply to IQAC as well, because they refer to specifically to the requirement sometimes for ADO, ADN clinical director colleagues for care groups to attend. That yeah, does yeah. happen at IQAC, and I think it perhaps should be reflected in the in the terminology and then sue you're down as a member of the performance committee but not of iquac and i just wonder if we should be consistent with both of them in other words it's almost a sort of seniority okay. thing is you don't want one of the committees to start having the deputies sent if you like and the other one not mm -hmm. and the last last little bit is i think um one thing that i quite like still to be on iquac's uh, agenda that i haven't thought of before is the area of revalidation appraisal um, because that's got such an impact on uh, yeah, patient yeah. experience. Hope they're helpful. Yeah, I, yeah think, I think that's consistent with the discussion that we had around medical education remaining with IQAC as well because it's sort of skills for quality yeah. essentially. Yeah. Mm. That's great. Thank you for that, Michael. Anybody else got any additions observations if not well this is a great progress in terms of where we're moving to and aligning our committees and the overall assurance for the board so thank you everyone for that so if there's nothing else uh, item 12 on the agenda is just to exclude the public uh, not to whether do we do have any members of the public so on that note it's now quarter past one we've run over quite a bit but then again we've gone through lots of documentation this morning so i suggest we meet at quarter to two would that be okay fine and then we'll try and you know move as quickly as we can through the private board meeting but uh, thank you for your time and we'll see you back again at quarter to two thank you, thank you.